Coleman Hughes, he writes a Substack on, well, here are all of the metrics to measure Gaza, and it doesn't seem like it's a concentration camp or anything like that. Norm's response was, it was an unreal response. I just couldn't believe this when I watched this. Oh, that's sneaky too. Hold on, I'm sorry, let me listen to this quote. You are just doing something clearly slimy here. Uh, Why would we ever go to a, I don't understand. Why would we go to the dictionary for a definition on genocide? Genocide is international law term. And he's not going to engage with a single factual analysis of leveraging the term concentration camp? By the way, he's not even giving us the context for these quotes, of which when I look up all three of them, she explicitly says that the Gaza Strip is a concentration camp, but it's not like Bergen-Belsen. It's not like a Nazi concentration camp. Not only is it not like a concentration camp, she says that she is opposed to parallels that lack information, knowledge, and understanding, and are drawn for purposes of provocation. The exact opposite of what the author intended. And he omits this last sentence when he's quoting her from that. New Harvard Harris poll, 82% of US citizens express support for Israel, why 18% express support for Hamas. Jesus, why is it Xmas? H-X-M-A-S, why do people do this shit? They don't wanna get shadow banned? I wanna be really, really, really careful around this topic, obviously, because it's Finkelstein's parents, but I feel like Finkelstein, the invocation of the, the, like, the Warsaw uprisings seems like one of the least appropriate and most disgusting links that you could ever draw to Hamas. I don't, and I'm trying to figure out if I'm missing information or if there are some events that I don't know that are like preceding things that I just don't have an understanding of. Um, because he, he does this, he, he leans onto two different things between the Nat Turner slave rebellion and the, um, and the Warsaw ghetto uprisings. And both of these seem unbelievably disgusting and wrong. It's disgusting in a moral e equivalence, and it's wrong in that the comparison just doesn't work at all. Uh, the Nat Turner slave rebellion were slaves that were killing their slave owners and other civilians, to be fair, with like torches and fence posts compared to Hamas, who is, their leadership are millionaires at least. They're fighting with AK-47s and rockets. They're not currently enslaved. Uh, the level of organization, coordination, financial support. Nat Turner and his slaves were not getting aid from all over the world and having an office at the UN dedicated to the management of their humanitarian issues. I don't understand how you can ever compare the Nat Turner slave rebellion to Hamas! I don't understand that comparison. I don't even know the steel man for it. I can't even think of a good steel man for it. That was the first thing. And then the second thing is the invocation of his parents apparently fought in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprisings. I've heard this said a few times before, I think by Finkelstein, maybe other people have heard this said a few times before, where it's like, um, yeah, the Jews engaged in like terrorism. And do you think that would have been bad for the Jews to fight against the Nazis and blah, blah, blah. So I looked up the specific, like um, the, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. If I'm not misunderstanding it, the fighting stopped when most of them had already been shipped off to death camps. The things that they fought against were the SS coming in to take them to the death camps. <laughs> and like, I think, what was it like? Was it 40,000? Is that too many? Got killed? Uh, by the SS officers coming in to murder them? <laughs> or if they didn't get murdered, they're gonna be shipped up to death camps. What, what the fuck is the comparison? Um, I thought that when Finkelstein brought this up, I just, because I don't, again, I don't have like the specific knowledge. I thought that it was like, a, oh, maybe like Jews were rebelling against like the, you know, Germany in, in 38 and 39 or, or in the in the 30s and they fought it, who blah, blah, blah. Am I missing events or something? Is there something that I'm not understanding? Because it can't be this bad. It can't be. There must be like events or something. Um, also, God damn, fuck. I gotta be very careful when studying nationalistic things in the future, okay? Because, damn, this is some wild shit. This is crazy. Um, what was it? Fi it was a fifty thousand. I think. It, I think was it forty thousand killed? Hold on, let me check. It was an insane amount of of Jews that got killed uh, trying to. Resist, and they knew they were dying too. This was a 
This is a no hope resistance. They 100% knew um, that they were gonna die uh, doing this shit. And they fought and they died. This is what was collected. But, uh, besides coming an estimated 56,000 Jews, um, this is what they had for arms. Seven Polish rifles, one Russian rifle, one German rifle, 59 pistols of various calibers, several hundred hand grenades, several hundred incendiary bottles. Hamas was literally <laughs> was literally paratroopering into the this isn't real but it was literally paratrooper like parachute flying in to the fucking to the fucking uh, in southern Israel to go and kill people what the f how do you ever make this comparison how do you ever compare the Jews like last stand in fucking Warsaw to the fucking Fortnite school bus droppers what the f are these comparisons am I missing something it just seemed wild. Oh, and there was this quote. Um, and nobody, it also is very, I, I, I'm extrapolating a little bit, but also I'm get, like, apparently nobody really gave a fuck about helping the Jews <laughs> in World War II as well. Um, what was the, uh, what was the, um, it was in these, I, I, there was like, it was like 60 pages of like declassified material. I just read through all this last night. It was so interesting listening to Diane. Um, and uh, and uh, Begin and uh, the U.S. president and everybody like the conversation back and forth were interesting, but it was interesting seeing a few of the. Uh, it, oh, it was a throwaway comment. I think Diane made a comment about how like um, something to do with begging Hungary to like bomb the. It was to bomb the train tracks leading to, um, what was the name of that concentration camp? Try, oh Treblinka. Oh, this wasn't Diane. This was Begin. Begin. Begin, 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 begin or begin. I took note of it and when my turn to respond arrived, I said the following. I wish you to know that the Jewish people are united today more than ever before in Israel. I especially noted the unity, the unity of the American Jewry because for a Romanian ruler, the American Jewry position is decisive. I added that this also applies to Jews in Britain and France. They are all united around us. I continued and said, you know very well what happened in 1944. Your Transylvania was within Hungary, and we requested that the British bomb the railroads that led to Auschwitz. Thousands of airplanes bombed all kinds of strategic targets, but refused to bomb those railroads. Nobody helped us. This is why the Jewish people are ready to face all dangers. I wanted you to know that, but if your scenario will be realized because of our policy, that means peace with security. Uh, then it is a disgrace to that particular country, and we shall stand tall for our rights. The back and forth um, negotiations. This, all of this stuff is so interesting. This must be published somewhere. Oh, this is way longer than six. This is like 180 pages. I don't trust anyone who uses the term Jewry. <laughs> it's a weird word, but. There's kind of like a lot of words in this region that's a little bit weird. It also feels weird as an American to say Arab. It feels racist. <laughs> Or to say Arab people or Arab states. It feels kind of weird. But I, I mean, like, I guess in like studying this region and everything, it's just like, it's, it's just more common. It makes sense. Oh, you think you're an expert then? What's the capital of Jordan? J. <laughs> Fuck. We gotta do US history. Fuck. The, all the history shit is so much more interesting. I hated history before. All the characters and all the people involved are just like super. I don't know. I think they're super fascinating. Oh, I thought I just thought this back and forth. It's also interesting because, like, when you read like the, I feel like they just have more personality. I don't know why, but I feel like in history classes, all the all of the leaders and all the conversations just seem so fucking sterile, or they just seem so boring. Like the president is like, oh, and then for the freedoms of our people, we must do these things. Like everybody speaks like a poet or whatever. Oh, this is kind of funny. I think these are secret. Uh, these were let me check top secret meetings between. I think this is Begin and Carter. It must have been, right? The main thing is that Assad and Sadat are ready for peace, and it is only proper to hold on to this opportunity. His opinion is that peace treaties with adequate in international guarantees will not only fortify the peace, but will strengthen Israel's security as well. Um, they have, Syria's constantly been like trying to get roped into a lot of these peace deals, and it's always kind of been there, but kind of not or whatever. Um, I said nothing about Hussein. Oh, but one of the big contentions around the Egyptian peace treaty is Israel doesn't want to recognize the PLO. PLO doesn't recognize Israel's existence. Israel doesn't want to recognize the PLO. There's a huge like thing about this like stuff with like, no, f f PLO, we don't want to recognize them, blah, blah, blah. I said nothing about Hussein because I know that you have better relations with him. 
but I also know that his participation in the Geneva Conference is tied to the issues of territories and the Palestinians. There is a good atmosphere for convening the Geneva Conference, but one basic issue is lacking, namely the participation of the representatives of the Palestinian people, and specifically of the PLO. This is Begin talk, or no, um, this is the president talking, sorry. Um, the participation of the representatives of the Palestinian people, and specifically the PLO. It is true that the PLO resorts to various forms of struggle that might be considered as unacceptable, these are similar to an organization that you were involved in Jerusalem during the British man mandate. And then uh, Begin's response of, I was very involved, dot, dot, dot. Because he was, he, um, Begin was the leader of the Irgun, who, which was like the terrorist arm, uh, essentially, and f in fewer words <laughs> of like the, <laughs> I don't know, that back and forth is right. I know, it's necessary to relate to the PLO as an organization that attempts to reach for 3 million people. <laughs> Did you see Norm's response to this guy's sub stack? No. I'm really torn on how I want this conversation to go. Like initially, I was like, I just want to discredit Norm as a f***ing academic. But now like, I feel pretty strongly about all the situations here. I hope it's a really good conversation. Like I hope that there's like decent ground covered on both sides and people have a better understanding of the complexities of all of this. Uh, I'm curious how, if he's really going to approach some of the arguments like he does in some videos. So this guy made a sub stack. Um, this is where my recent understanding of maybe the conditions in Gaza actually aren't really that bad at all pre-October 7th. And he says, because Norm always uses this concentration camp example over and over again. So this guy, uh, Coleman Hughes, he writes a substack on, well, here are all of the metrics to measure Gaza, and it doesn't seem like it's a concentration camp or anything like that. Norm's response was, he quoted three other people that said it was like a concentration camp. Norm quoted three people. Yeah. And he said, uh, and that was it. That was his uh, actual response. Does I anybody guess have one a, of them was like a Holocaust survivor or some shit? Yeah. One was that a, a Leah. It was some friend he has that used to work in the Gaza Strip, but I think she actually had to flee. It was an un, it was an unreal response. I just couldn't believe this when I watched this. Let me find this. Hold on. Oh, Amira Haas. Do you know who that is? No. Oh man. Here you You're go. So I have to try not to get frustrated. This is basically a blog, or this is in response to this Substack post that just goes over a lot of the HDI life expectancy, stuff like that. And then this is Norm's response. I'll play another background so I might be able to listen. I'm doing the times two thing, yeah. Here's the question I have for Mr. Hughes. The question is this. He says my use of the locution concentration camp is exaggerated at one point. I think he described it as me lying and things like that. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. You can claim I have an agenda and I am tailoring my language to further my agenda. But here's my question for Mr. Hughes. If you were now uh, Mark Lamont Hill, if you were to go onto your little computer device and enter the word G I O R A, Giora, Island, E I L A N D, okay? Yeah. And then you enter concentration camp. Uh, yes. Okay. And now you're going to find a memorandum from March 2004. And if you scroll down to number 12, paragraph 12, you're going to see Giora Island. And how does he describe Gaza? Concentration camp. A huge concentration camp. Yeah. Now, Mr. Hughes, here is my question to you. Gira Island was the head of Israel's National Security Council, the equivalent of our head of the CIA, Mr. Burns, now. He's clearly knowledgeable about these subjects. He's making this statement describing Gaza as, quote, a huge concentration camp before Israel even imposed the blockade of Gaza. The blockade of Gaza was imposed in January 2006. He makes this statement into March 2004. Why do you think he said that? Don't, do you think that Mr. Island has an agenda like Norman Finkelstein? Mr. Island is a completely bestial, knowledgeable, but bestial character. In the past few weeks, he said we should make Gaza uninhabitable. He yep. said the epidemics in the south of Gaza are a good thing. He said that we have to keep up, even when they start, keep up, even when the international community starts showing pictures of those incubators with babies dying in it. This is Giara Island. So obviously, he he's, not, he's, not, he's not a war dove, and he's not an anti-Zionist. Right, he's not in my camp. <laughs> yeah. And we will grant, when you talk about a middle developing country, you think of, I would think of Ecuador. I'm in Ecuador, a very pleasant place, a middle developing country. People aren't extremely poor, they're not extremely rich. Nobody going into Ecuador would describe it as a concentration camp. Right. That would be a very far fetched description, but according to Coleman Hughes, roughly the same. Ecuador, Gaza. Right. Why is it, why is it that Mr. Island used that locution to describe Gaza? Now, if you open up page 169 of Baruch Kimmerling's book, Politicide, yes. he describes Gaza on page 169. He describes it as, quote, the biggest concentration camp ever to exist or largest concentration camp ever to exist. Why did a senior academic at yep. the Hebrew University, why did he use that descriptive? It was just a developing country like Gaza, where people went to the mall, they had burgers and fries at McDonald's, and every once in a while, they went on a European vacation. It's an interesting thing, since nobody can go out of Gaza. Right, how and there's no airport, and there's no airport. It's, it's, it's a fascinating argument. How, how, that, how that occurred. Let me take one last person. Israel's leading authority, probably the leading authority in the world on life in Gaza. Sarah Roy is the leading authority on the economics of Gaza. I think I can claim, it's a tiny distinction like the tallest building in Wichita, Kansas, but I can claim to have the most knowledge of the political history of Gaza. But 
the person with life experience. And a stickler for detail is Amira Haas. She lived in Gaza for a sustained period of time. She wrote a classic book on her experience living in Gaza. She's Israel's, uh, uh, she's the journalist on uh, Haaretz, Israel's most distinguished, not mass, not mass selling, but distinguished newspaper. She's their paper rock, record. Their, yeah, paper record. She's their um, uh, authority on the occupied territory. She and Gideon Levy. Now, let me just say a couple of things about Amira Haas before I read what she had to say. First of all, she's a stickler for detail. Second of all, her family passed through the Nazi Holocaust. Third of all, not trivially, she detests Hamas. Detests, loathes Hamas. Sometimes, in my opinion, it distorts her judgment, but she would probably say the fact that I don't loathe and detest Hamas distorts my judgment. And we just have to agree to disagree. I'd like to hear, I'd like Mr. Coleman Hughes, listen to this woman, daughter of survivors of the Nazi Holocaust, hypersensitive to facts. I would say she is a genuine rival to me, to facts, to truth, and also has what Mr. Coleman doesn't have life experience living there. And here she writes, uh, it's a little long, but I want to read it. Facts. Sure. The Gaza Strip today, or I should give you the date. The date is, I think it was about three, three years ago. I didn't copy it, about three years ago. The Gaza Strip today is a concentration camp, but not like Bergen Belsen concentration camp. That was one of the Nazi concentration camps. The differences are clear and known. This writer, meaning herself, is opposed to parallels, lacking information, knowledge, and understanding, drawn for, pur drawn for purposes of provo pro provo provocation. But this writer is also opposed to creating hierarchies of suffering, which, whether concealed or openly, justify any suffering that does not reach the climax, which we, the Jews, define, meaning she's against those who say, it's not the Holocaust. It's terrible, it's awful, but it's not the Holocaust. Right. And so she says, in the Gaza Strip, which is closed off like a confined and separated camp, lives some two million people in one of the most densely populated places in the world. About 70% of them are the descendants of refugees expelled from their homes. Absent freedom of movement, condemn them to a life of unemployment, a life of dreariness, a life of poverty, a life of disease, a life of depression, a life of contaminated water and soil, and dependence on ever-dwindling charity. And that is even without the military bombings and incursions, the mowing of the lawn, which we'll get to in a moment. Absolutely. Bergen Belsen, as a prisoner's camp, and thereafter as a concentration camp and extermination camp for Jews, it was dismantled after about four years of existence with the defeat of the Third Reich. The concentration camp that is Gaza has existed under even ever, excuse me, I have to be careful with the words. The concentration camp that is Gaza has existed under ever harsher conditions for almost three decades. Contrary to Israeli propaganda, it was created before the suicide bombings, before the Oslo Accord of 1993, before Hamas took charge and developed its military skills. Israel has a political goal in mind in turning Gaza into a giant concentration camp, cutting it and its inhabitants off from the rest of the Palestinians so that it will become a separate entity deprived of history, roots, and belonging. Well, that's Gaza. So my question, it's a, it's a genuine perplexity, assuming good faith by Coleman Hughes, and he's not just pandering to his subscribers, assuming good faith. I would want to know, why would uh, Guerra Island call it a huge concentration camp? Why would Baruch Kimmerling call it the largest concentration camp ever? Why would uh, Amira Haas call it a giant concentration camp? Yeah, but like, what an argument. <laughs> um, it took a long time to make it. Could you not have just said three other people called it? Yeah, I know. Camp. It's such an annoying <laughs> thing. Yeah, you're going to have fun not interrupting all that. I don't know. So it seems to be that it's a concentration camp because what people are stateless and they can't leave. Yeah. Right? See, that's so. This it's is the, the game. Conditions. Yeah. It's this is the, the game yeah, yeah. that he plays that I think is really interesting. Is so he'll cite her quote, and I've read her quote, but she doesn't actually refer to anything concrete. She just says a bunch of things, right? Like dreariness, uh, unemployment, uh, mm -hmm. poverty, disease, depression, uh, contaminated water and soil, and dependence on charity. Like n none of these things are hallmarkers of like a concentration camp. They could be like kind of shitty living conditions, but one, the data doesn't make it seem like abhor abhorrent, like completely fucked. And two, yeah, the, the concentration camp is not just, it's just not what's, what, what he's bringing to know, mind when he say says like, it. Yeah, sorry. Would, yeah, do, I, mean, you, I don't know. If, if it becomes like part of the debate, you can just like, I would personally, I would probably just ask like, all right, so what characteristics does it have that are reminiscent of a concentration camp? Is it like the living conditions? Or you can't really ask questions, though, because you'll just talk for like five minutes. <laughs> no, I know. I am, I, that's oh, explicitly, no. unfortunately, can't be part of my strategy. It has to be a, yeah. um, I have to state my yeah, questions, the, basically statements, and then leave them open at the end, basically, yeah. Oh, God, just do it back. Just ask the question back. But just be like, uh, I feel like the question I would ask is, uh, what kind of essential characteristics of a concentration camp does Gaza have? Is it like the living conditions, or is it the uh, hunger situation that was reminiscent of places like the Warsaw Ghetto? Well, from my recollection, the Warsaw Ghetto uh, had a hunger plan 
basically or a hunger policy put in place over it which resulted in like 108 uh, the population of the ghetto only getting limited to 180 calories a day so it's not that kind of like conditions or it's not the uh fact that there are guards coming in there and killing you for your political opinions like mm -hmm. just um and like the like half of your population um it's not their position on the humanitarian index it's none of that so then yeah it would be like the fact that they can't leave or because of the fucking play but you could just spend like a long time making that point i don't know <laughs> yeah i think basically or the um even the quotations yeah quotations to support his argument like all all of the quotes that he's using to support his argument don't seem to have anything to do with concentration camp as a living conditions like when he points out that eled guy's quote um it seems like he's just saying there's a lot of people that live here basically um it, mm -hmm. i think it was a proposal for um did this have to do with egypt's land swap but it's uh repeating a personal view that he had previously expressed to other usg visitors nsc director island laid out for ambassador uh, jerry jean uh, a different endgame solution that that which is commonly envisioned as the two-state solution Elan's view, he said, was prefaced on the assumption that demographic and other considerations make the prospect for a two-state solution between the Jordan and the Mediterranean unviable. Currently, he said, there are 11 million people in Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, and that number will increase to 36 million in 50 years. The area between Beer Shiva, uh, Shiva, I don't know, and the northern tip of Israel, including the West Bank and Gaza, has the highest population density in the world. Gaza alone, he said, is already, quote, a huge concentration camp, end quote, with 1.3 million Palestinians. Moreover, the land is surrounded on three sides by deserts. Palestinians need more land, and Israel can ill afford to concede it. The solution, he argues, lies in the Sinai Desert. Like, that was that quote. It's not like a, mm -hmm. it, he wasn't like doing an analysis on, like, the living conditions of the Palestinians. I think he's just referring to the fact there's a fuck ton of people that live in this space. <laughs> Um, it's weird because one of the people he read, uh, I think it might have been the second one, when you when you take that argument about like the idea that people can't leave and that there a lot of a lot of them are like stateless or they're all stateless and then they don't have an airport or some shit like that. Well, that's like um, that would mean that Gaza was a and even before the blockade, right? One of them said before the blockade it was a concentration camp. So I would want to know why Gaza wasn't a concentration camp under Egyptian rule, because I don't think the Egyptians left and let anyone leave Gaza until like 1952 or 56 or something. So there was like quite a few years under Egyptian rule where Gazans were not allowed to leave. They had to stay there. Why was that not? Was it to did Egypt make Gaza a concentration um, camp as well? I think just that like one part of the world that everyone wants to make up. I have to be careful bringing up old people uh, or older conflict things in relevant analyses. Like if we're doing historical stuff, I can bring that up. But in current stuff, he might just say like, well, uh, if you're going to condemn the old Egyptians uh, and say that Israel is even better than them, and then you say that their treatment is the same, like, well, that's your problem, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't want to make a comparison between old Egypt and modern Israel because you say, well, they say they're a democracy and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's the problem you'd run into. What do you have coming up? Anything fun or? Uh, not for a while, I don't think. Why not? I don't know. Um, I've tried to get a few debates with just like other creators, but I guess like none of them bite. So I might need to go do some more. I might need to be insane on Twitter. Maybe that's the maybe that's the way. Who knows? Trying to debate on. I don't know Israel. Fucking. Oh. Whatever. Um, I want to. I do think I it's really considering oh doing a video essay on bad quotes and Wikipedia entries about Israel Palestine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is like... a lot. I thought about this, but I don't have the time or it'll destroy my fucking stream. But it would be curious after reading and researching a ton. There is a lot of stuff on Wikipedia in relation to this conflict that could be up updated quite a bit that meaningfully changes um, a lot of like the yeah. everything going on. Yeah. That's kind of what I want. I want, to, I want to grab that stuff and just kind of show it all just to like maybe, I don't know. I don't even know what the point of that is. Just like, but even even from authors as well, because obviously like that Khalidi appeal to the French thing, that would be a good example of just like someone being kind of wrong. On yeah, completely. Yeah, it's like, yeah um, or yeah, th there are loads of them. There are loads of examples of different things like from the Israeli and the Palestinian side and how like uh, be, I guess like just the moral of the story being like be mindful of like partisans who are like so clearly trying to sell you only one side of the story with like just a couple of sentences here and there from cherry picked from a hundred plus years of history. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know. maybe something like that. Yeah, it's really frustrating that like Hassan will never debate me on this and Noah Sampson will never debate me on this, but Hassan will react to a video of Noah Sampson reacting to tweets of mine on this. <laughs> Like, what a bizarre world. 
The the Noah video is actually kind of funny. Like he um he argues like a debate bro. It's like he he's like like just like a walking logical fallacy of just things that like look or sound good but don't actually really make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, he does that like all the way through. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um which is characteristic of so much of the rhetoric really relating to everything to be fair. I guess it's not unique to this, but hmm. um I don't know. I uh I think I've also got a video that I'm doing with Dylan about Mearsheimer and why he was wrong about Ukraine. Which part? Um, the, the Mostly the 2014 paper, why it was America's fault, and also just all the bad predictions he's made ever since. Wait, and does Mearsheimer think that like we helped install the new leadership or something? Not really, although he does kind of give you the threads that you need to start going that way by yourself. He does give you a little bit of that, but his his thing mostly is that NATO expansion and pulling Ukraine into the EU was what like divided Ukraine between the pro-European West and the pro-Russian East, and then kind of like uh, basically put Russia in a situation where they felt that their security interests and their uh, sphere of influence was challenged sufficiently that they were going to intervene. So yeah, he basically blames Europe and America for um, the crisis in Ukraine in 2014 and for Russian aggression. Based. And he is very snaky with the way he uh, uses statistics and the way he um, describes certain aspects of the conflict. I know I noticed one part from his lecture, the viral 30 million view lecture that he did. Yeah. Um, there's a bit in it when, you know, in 2014, when uh, Putin offered Ukraine that $15 billion deal to keep them into the away from joining the EU or the EU customs agreement. Um, uh, yes, I remember this fuck because he wanted to draw them into their trade union. I don't remember, or their, their customs union basically, but what about it? Yeah, so he describes this deal as a terrific deal compared to the EU deal, which was actually not very good at all. That's insane. That's, okay. that's what he does in his lecture. Mm -hmm. And he's asked like half an hour later in the Q&A what the terms of the Russian deal were. And he just says, I have no idea. Like. So just like shit like that. There's like there's a few little bits oh, like Jesus. that where he is just being very like like the Russian sympathies are just so unavoidably like transparent. My yeah. understanding for the differences between these two things and why the EU one was like clearly better was the European Union thing would have just basically established like a trading agreement between the European Union and <clears throat> Ukraine. That's it. But the the Russian one would have drafted the the it would have drafted Ukraine into their trade union. Like they would have joined a whole other body and basically lost the ability to bilaterally negotiate well, anything else. Um, and they would have to adopt all the same customs and tariffs or whatever the fuck else that Russia had essentially as part of this trade union with them in Belarus, no? Or am I misunderstanding? That wasn't exactly the problem because it wasn't actually, there wasn't explicitly anything about Ukraine joining the Eurasian Customs Union in that 15 billion thing. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that the terms of the EU deal were public and they were very clearly laid out. Like it involved, um, it had the terms, it had the conditions, it had the, uh, whatever, the, the travel to Europe. Like it, Get, it would allow people like tra like free travel between uh, Ukraine and EU countries, but the Russian one didn't have any terms. There was nothing apart from things like um, the uh, one of the things was like a, a a subsidy on oil. Like I think they were gonna like Russian state-owned oil companies would shave off a third of their charge to Ukraine, but they never stated exactly how long that discount would be there. They there was just lots of different things like that where they. Uh, so many of the benefits of the deal and the terms of it could have just been rescinded at any point if they wanted to. Um, but also because there was nothing like there was no terms and conditions actually properly laid out, most people assumed it was going to be like the path into the Eurasian customs deal, which would have shut them off from the rest of the world, basically. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um. Anyway. I need to go off stream and have food, so. Okay, wait, will you come back in 30 minutes? Maybe longer than 30 minutes, but yeah, sure. This this lady's quote is unhinged. I tried to look up the article where she made this quote and it's, oh, that's sneaky too. Hold on, let me, I'm sorry. Let me listen to this quote. Situation camp that is Gaza has existed under ever harsher conditions to situation camp for Jews. It was this prisoner's camp, and thereafter as a concentration camp, and it's a moment. Absolutely. Bergen-Belsen as a prisoner's camp, and thereafter as a concentration camp, and extermination camp for Jews. It was dismantled after about four years of existence. Wait. With the defeat of the movement. 
condemned them to a ton, two million people is closed off because any holds to creating hierarchies of suffering, which whether conceived of provocation, lacking information, knowledge, and this are clear and known. This writer, meaning herself, is opposed to fishing camp. That was one of the Nazi countries. Okay. The Gaza Strip today is a concentration camp, but not like Bergen-Delsen concentration camp. That was one of the Nazi concentration camps. The differences are clear and known. This writer, meaning herself, is opposed to parallels, lacking information, knowledge, and understanding, drawn for, pur- drawn for purposes of provo- pro- provocation. But this writer is also opposed to creating hierarchies of suffering, which, whether concealed or openly, justify any suffering that does not reach the climax, which we, the Jews, define, meaning she's against those who say, it's not the Holocaust. It's terrible. It's awful, but it's not the Holocaust. Right. And so she says, in the Gaza Strip, which is closed off like a confined and separated camp, lives some ton- two million people in... I don't know if I consider this... It's okay. I'm sorry. You can tell me if this is fair or not. I might be too mind fucked. Uh, we can listen to him read this at normal speed. Sorry. But this writer is also opposed to creating hierarchies of suffering, which was a concentration camp. The Gaza Strip okay. date is, I think it was about three, or three years ago. I didn't copy it, about three years ago. The Gaza Strip today is a concentration camp, but not like Bergen Delsen concentration camp. That was one of the Nazi concentration camps. The differences are clear and known. This writer, meaning herself, is opposed to parallels, lacking information, knowledge, and understanding, drawn for, pur- for, drawn for purposes of provo- pro- provo- provocation. But this writer is also opposed to creating hierarchies of suffering, which, whether concealed or openly, justify any suffering that does not reach the climax, which we, the Jews, define, meaning she's against those who say, it's not the Holocaust. It's terrible, it's awful, but it's not the Holocaust. Right. And so she says, in the Gaza Strip, which is closed off like a confined and separated camp, lives some ton- two million people in one of the most densely populated places in the world. About 70% of them are the descendants of refugees expelled from their homes. Absent freedom of movement, condemn them to a life of unemployment, a life of dreariness, a life of poverty, a life of disease, a life of depression, a life of contaminated water and soil, and dependence on ever dwindling charity. And that is even without the military bombings and incursions, the mowing of the lawn, which we'll get to in a moment. Absolutely. Bergen Belsen, as a prisoner's camp, and thereafter as a concentration camp and extermination camp for Jews, it was dismantled after about four years of existence with the defeat of the Third Reich. The concentration camp that is Gaza has existed under even ever, excuse me, I have to be careful with the words. The concentration camp that is Gaza, has existed under ever harsher conditions for almost three decades. Contrary to Israeli propaganda, it was created before the suicide bombings, before the Oslo Accord of 1993, before Hamas took charge and developed its military skills. Israel has a political goal in mind in turning Gaza into a giant concentration camp, cutting it and its inhabitants off from the rest of the Palestinians so that it will become a separate entity deprived of history, roots, and belonging. Well, that's Gaza. So my question, it's a, real, it's a genuine perplexity, assuming a good faith by Coleman Hughes, and he's not just pandering to his subscribers, assuming good faith, I would want to know, why would uh, Guerra Island call it a huge concentration camp? Why would... Baruch Kimmerling call it the largest concentration camp ever. Why would uh, Amira Haas call it a giant concentration camp? That just genuinely perplexes me. But but let's- It's so interesting what he's doing here, okay? Maybe my reading is totally wrong. So the context is, because I actually feel like he's reading her quote. I see her quote now and I understand it more. I feel like he's actually reading her quote exactly incorrectly. So. Um, when Norm says concentration camp, Norman is bringing up concentration camp to evoke like desperation, poverty, extreme suffering, the types of conditions that Jews suffered in concentration camps, and then justification for Hamas to rise up and fight. That's what Norm brings up. That's what he's hoping to evoke when he says concentration camp. And that's evident by the fact that he's bringing up concentration camp in response to a guy who made a post about the living conditions, right? He's very specifically citing people that are bringing up concentration camp. Now, the interesting thing about her quote is it feels like 
she's in a way calling out almost the exact opposite. So for instance, she says, the Gaza Strip today is a concentration camp, but not like Bergen-Belsen. The differences are clear and known. This writer is opposed to parallels that are lacking information, knowledge and understanding, and are drawn for purposes of provocation, which is what Norm is doing, but is also opposed to creating hierarchies of suffering, which, whether concealed or openly, justify any suffering that does not reach the climax, which we the Jews define. So what she's saying here is that the conditions in Gaza are bad, but not because they're like a concentration camp of where people are suffering and dying and being exterminated, but they're bad because of what she goes into later and that it's a people who can't migrate, who are cut off from their history, et cetera, et cetera. But it's funny because Norm is casting her quote in with a pot of other quotes to use concentration camp as a means of provo uh, provocation when she's explicitly saying here that um, she's opposed to parallels that lack information, knowledge, and understanding and are drawn for purposes of provocation. That's very interesting that... Oh, hi. <clears throat> um, so it's interesting that he would use this quote here, I think. Um, oh, and then it's also interesting because at the end, now it's, I don't know if this was, I'm going to, I'm going to be ultra, 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 ultra charitable. Um, I'm going to be ultra charitable. Ever. Why would the rest of the Palestinians cutting it and its inhabitants plus its military skills? Hold on. 1993. Before the suicide, contrary to Israel, ever harsher of the words, the concentration camp that is Gaza has ever, excuse me, that is existence with the defeat of the Third Reich and thereafter as a concentration, even without the military bombings and incursions, the mowing of the lawn, which we'll get to in a moment. Hold on. And Jesus, he talks a life of disease. Oh my God. Girl, which is closed off like a confined, as She's against those who say, it's not the Holocaust. It's terrible. It's awful. Oh, okay. Killed or openly justify any suffering that does not reach the climax, which we, the Jews, define. Meaning, she's against those who say, it's not the Holocaust. It's what? Don't worry about the kitchen stuff. I'll clean it up while you're gone. Oh, okay. I love you. Okay. I don't know if this is intentional. I'm going to chalk it up to he accidentally thought that he finished the paragraph and he skipped to the next one. And it doesn't have a dramatic change in meaning, but it's interesting that he skips this part of the paragraph when he's reading. I found the original article, not the one that this, uh, not the one that um, Mark has up, but the actual article, the Heretz article that this comes from. It's terrible. It's awful, but it's not. So we openly justify any suffering that does not reach the climax, which we, the Jews, define, meaning She's against those who say, it's not the Holocaust. It's terrible, it's awful, but it's not the Holocaust. Right. And so she says, in the Gaza Strip. So he skips this sentence at the end here that says, the use here of the term concentration camp is based on the need to break free of the linguistic bonds of the Nazi period. So it's interesting that in this paragraph, she's basically saying that she doesn't want concentration camp used for issues of provocation, but the reason why she's using concentration camp is that she wants to broaden the meeting to include things that don't just mean Nazi-like concentration camp. But it's interesting because Norm is explicitly invoking concentration camps. He explicitly mentions his parents that fought in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And he's explicitly making, making reference to Israel being like fucking Nazis and like the Third Reich. And he's doing it for purposes of provocation, which seem to stand in exact contrast to what she's attempting to do by invoking the term concentration camp. It's interesting that he omits this last sentence, but maybe he finished this here and just skipped to the next paragraph because he thought he'd read it. But I think that's an interesting, I think that's interesting that he misses that sentence there. Which is closed off like a confined. Because her definition of concentration camp is essentially, and she defines it in, in as many words in the next few things, right? Um, it's a lot of people that are descendants of refugees. They don't have freedom of movement. And then she kind of like brings some general stuff up here. Um, But she's saying that like all these conditions were created even before the blockade, before the Oslo Accord. So this is a concentration camp in the 50s, 60s, or I'm sorry, no, it would have been just in the 70s and 80s, I guess. Um, yeah. Have you read any of Finkelstein's books or any of his work or like even like a couple chapters or anything that he's... Yeah, I've uh, yeah, I'm actually reading, I'm reading uh, Method of Mandus. That's the one where he... Uh... 
that's the twenty four his twenty fourteen book where he um he actually talks about the rockets being harmless. Mm-hmm. One thing I, I've really noticed, and I actually want to make this point when I talk to you about it, is just how bad of a site of a cider. Oh f- you, yeah. That's what I was gonna bring up. I was shocked and appalled when I started going through footnotes on Inquest into Martyrdom and annotations. I such that it like <clears throat> It reminded me a lot of, uh, are you familiar with like, the David Irving stuff? Yeah. I, I don't know if this is, and it started to black penalty a bit. I don't know if this is a standard for historians or pop historians or what, but yeah, very rarely will the underlying annotation or citation actually support what he's saying. Sometimes it's to the exact contrary. Other times it's just wildly taken out of context. But I noticed that his citations very rarely like fully back up what he's saying. He also writes incredibly provocatively compared to any other historian that I've like seeing, like he writes like it's a like a Substack or a Medium or a Facebook post or whatever, um, in, in how he writes too. It's like very yeah, yeah. Not well, not just that. He also has just a whole bunch of statements he will make. Where in any other fi- like in any field, you would just expect there to be a citation. A citation, yeah. Oh yeah, like well, you'll get you'll get somebody where it's like um, I might say something like um, <clears throat> so like this this sounds like something Finkelstein right. If Finkelstein was talking about cars, he would write something like this. Um, Yesterday, Steven showed up in his Ford Focus RS, and it was a four-cylinder car, but he had to race the Mustang, um, which is a uh, summer V8. We'll say the V8 version of the Mustang. Um, And he'll cite, like, both of those things. And then he'll say, like, obviously the V8 Mustang is much faster than the Ford Focus. And there won't be a citation for that. But I notice he'll draw inferences sometimes from underlying things he cites, and then he'll just state a fact. Like, wait, wait, hold on. Do you know that? Or if that conclusion is valid, why are you, no offense, you have no specialties in any of these things, why are you citing the underlying facts and then drawing a conclusion that requires a bit of extrapolation? Shouldn't somebody else have made that conclusion that you can cite to? Um, yeah. Yeah. The other thing you see is like he'll he'll make claim A, B, C, D, and E, mm-hmm. and then when you look at and then he'll have like one citation at the end of the paragraph. I'm like, okay. So when I go to this citation, I'll, oh. I'll A, B, C, D, and E, and then I go and it's just E. Yeah. Right. Like A, B. Wait, where is A, B, C, D? And it's not to say that he necessarily like it like they're not there. It's just I have to do the work to look up where A and B and C and D are, and I have to track them down myself. Mm-hmm. That that just is not. Like, I don't know what field that's standard in. It's just like, no, like, you need to cite A and B and C and D. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so even, so sometimes it's like, no, it's just, it's just totally off. Sometimes it's, no, this is kind of misleading. Sometimes it's just like, he's right, but like, there was just no citation there. And I had to like, do all the work to dig it up for you. Yeah. Like, where, yeah, so. Yeah, I don't know why people like, I, I'm pretty convinced at this point that, Everyone just like glazing this guy over like the footnotes and the rigor of his citations. Just I don't think they've actually read his books, or they've read the book. Well, no, you're right. They haven't read the books. But if they have read the books, they haven't actually chased down the the underlying yeah. citations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or they've just read the books and like like they they just look at them and be like, oh f- yeah, Finkelstein, yeah. Yeah. You know? And I don't. I always get nervous, and I'm only based on this. Well, now on Finkelstein and that Irving guy, because that was always the defense of Irving. He has so many citations. He has so many footnotes. How could he possibly be wrong? And I'm like, <laughs> well, pretty easily, apparently. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, um, okay. I'm sorry. This. I'm digging. Uh, somebody challenged Finkelstein on the conditions in Gaza being like that of a concentration camp, and Finkelstein's response was to just quote three people. Um, and I'm just I'm just reading real quick that the second quote here of the concentration camp thing because I don't think he actually justifies that assertion at all. So well, I mean, I, I, had a, I had a question for people who compare it to the concentration camp, and this is pre October seventh. Was um, like name one other example of a concentration camp where people are allowed to leave to work in an, in another territory? Yeah, that was my. That was my going to be my question, but I'm so scared that there's going to be some obscure camp or fact that I don't know about. Because that was going to be my question. Like, okay, God, the Gaza Strip is a concentration camp. Which one? What concentration camp exactly are we comparing it to? And I don't know if, like, fucking Germany took over some sliver of land from fucking Finland and set up, like, the world's most luxurious concentration camp that they forgot about. And the Jews lived in, like, peace and happiness. There was some dumb autistic shit like that or something. Yeah. Be afraid of that because you move then is just to say okay well then like it's buzzword deconstruction time it's like okay well if you're gonna stretch the word of concentration camp to the point where it includes things like the most liberal concentration camp where you're basically just living a life and you can need a checkpoint to go through mm-hmm. 
You can do that if you want, but it's it's the connotation is not matching your denotation anymore. When you say concentration camp, it's very clear the connotation you're trying to to put into that word. Mm -hmm. You're trying when people think of a concentration camp, they're not thinking of that liberal t type of whatever it is that you know. Well, you get to live your life, you get to work, you get to you know you have your girlfriend, whatever, and then you just need to go through a checkpoint, and it's annoying or it's hard or, or and conditions are worse than they would normally be, but. They're thinking of fucking Auschwitz. They're thinking of, like, the, the internment of the Japanese. They're thinking of, you know, that's what the connotation is there. And so mm -hmm. when you, you're using that word, it's like, yeah, you're, you're able to, to modify the denotation of the word to stretch it to include, um, you know, this is much more benign thing. But that connotation is like, you know what it's like? It's like if someone accuses you, let's say someone accuses you of rape and say, okay, you're a rapist. Like, okay, well, how am I a rapist? Well... On Discord, you, know, you emoted that you were fucking that girl and you didn't even ask her for consent when you typed in star, I slide my dick into your exactly. little or, or pussy better, like, star. And it's like, well, okay. Yeah, it's like, you're right, but you, well, actually, when you married your wife, there was like an age gap there. And like, you know, I know she was an adult and, you know, maybe she was like, you know, 26, but like you were way older. And then, so there's like a power imbalance there. So it's really questionable how much consent she had. Like, that's what I mean by you're a rapist. So like, okay, if you want to stretch the word rapist like that, fine. But like, you're, again, your connotation is not matching your denotation. So that's the move to make if like he comes up with some obscure example of concentration camp where like, oh, well, it's the peachy concentration camp. Like, okay, yeah. Fine, yeah. It's frustrating because there's the invocation of so much language. Um, and, and you know what they're like, I don't even this is this is a hot take that I'm, I don't know how much I'm going to defend this, but um, I, like I don't like the usage of the term ethnic cleansing. Um, I think no, it's no, a, no, I either. Yeah, it's no, it, it's doing the same thing. It's a horrible expression. When it was initially applied, it was to the fucking Bosnians. OK, that were actually genociding people. And the idea that this has become like retroactively the way that we define every population transfer in Israel policy is just such a stupid fucking. Nobody thinks of like people moving or being expelled from homes when they think of ethnic cleansing. They think of genocide and they think of racial superiority because you're cleansing. You're getting rid of like a inferior ethnicity. Like it's just such a stupid fucking. I hate the. I hate that term. It's so dumb. Yeah, and look, the procedure for that term is the same procedure as the rape term and the same procedure as the any other term like that, like the or the, you know, concentration camp term is saying, okay, well, by ethnic cleansing, if if you mean like, so I, I actually make a differentiation between the per se and the non per se variant of ethnic cleansing. So by per se, I mean, it, it's like the, the underlying motivation for the, the removing a group of people from an area is not a security concern. It's not like something that would end up saving lives. It's not something that would result in like, you know, something well, that we would consider better. It's just like, they want to move these people because they are a given race or a given nationality. Or given yeah, race, not but the, the issue is that like the per se definitions of all of these words are incredibly fucking important. And that's why they are what called what they are. But then people will throw out the, the um, they'll throw out like the special intent required to make these things work. So like, for instance, when you say like apartheid, Right. The mm -hmm. big differentiation yep. in Israel has to do with citizenship and non-citizenship. It's not really on ethnic lines. Yeah. When you talk about like a genocide, it's not even if you blew up an entire village and killed 20,000 civilians, that's not genocide. That's they're not yeah. trying to, ex to extinguish the race of. Yeah, it's uh, it's all of these are so frustrating. Yeah. The point to make with ethnic cleansing is like it, the, the key to, to spot is that if if they're use again, denotation, connotation, if they use the denotation of ethnic cleansing to a non per se version, but while still maintaining the connotation of a per se version, that's what you got to call out saying, no, 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 wait a minute. You're when you say ethnic cleansing, you mean this stretched out thing that includes things that could be good. <laughs> you're but but you're connotating at me something that's just so as if it's so obviously bad. Yeah, but that's a hard one because <laughs> I like I've said my edgier way of saying that even is that like I've said like well not all forms of ethnic cleansing then are necessarily bad right because if you're saying like for instance the Sinai Peninsula was ethnically cleansed when when Israel gave it back to Egypt they got rid of all the settlers there is that bad mm -hmm. but like that sounds like an unhinged statement and I feel like it's already an optics loss to even begin on the stage of like well is all ethnic cleansing bad if we're going to define it this way because it just sounds unhinged you know yeah. Like, for instance, like, I would say that, like, all genocides must not be bad if we consider the Republican statement of abortion is a genocide. <laughs> if that's a true statement, well, okay, well, what the fuck is genocide at that point, right? I guess it's like a, yeah, like, it's, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. The point to make is just that, look, you, it's, it's the same, look, I think, uh, who is the other guy that you're, uh, that's going to be with Norm? Um, Rabani, um, Muin Rabani or something? I don't know if I'm his name. 
made is like, you know, you, you are like he, he. I think he recognized this on some level because he he talked about when he d debated this guy uh, and got, he got charged with anti-Semitism and he's like, okay, well, you're clearly stretching the definition of that word. You're 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 connotating at me. Like he he, he didn't use these exact words, but he, the point was that you're connotating anti-Semitism at me. But the denotation of anti-Semitism is just so denigrated now. It's just so it's just so stretched that what what does it mean anymore? And that, that's the similar point to make back. It's like, okay, when you say ethnic cleansing, um, you're, you're clearly connotating something like that, oh, that has to always be bad. And it has to, and not just bad, it's like one of the worst things ever. Yeah. But when you actually look, but when, you're, when you actually are plugging in what you're talking about, you're not actually talking about expelling a group of people because of their race per se, because of their bloodline per se, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a security concern and... You know, and it's not even clear that you know, it's it's not clear that they're like even not going to be let back. It's like maybe yeah, and even and honestly, even if it wasn't a security concern, even if it was for like territorial expansion or something, that still uh, wouldn't make any of it like an apartheid, an ethnic cleansing, a concentration camp, a genocide. Like even at that, like we're not at that level yet. But it feels like yeah, anytime if a lot of people die or if a lot of people are unhappy and Israel is involved, we bring out like the big boy words to describe literally everything it reminds me of like 19 year olds talking about their breakups today where in my day it was like oh i broke up it was kind of a shitty relationship now when you talk to like a teenager you're like yeah i broke up with my boyfriend he loved bombed me and then he gaslit me and then he psychologically abused me uh and then i'm traumatized and i have ptsd and it's like bro you just had a bad like two month relationship what are you talking about um yeah it's just like unhinged the language yeah no it's it's uh no i did a whole video on like uh these buzzwords it's a uh, buzzword, buzzword deconstruction it's it's uh yeah, uh, part, it, it applies to all. And by the way, you should. One thing to realize is that human shield is also a buzzword. You have to be be clear about in what sense a human shield is being used as well. Yep, I'm aware. Uh, it's li it's literally only a thing I think that's kind of mentioned in international uh, customary international humanitarian law. Um, and then, like, even the strict definition of it is like iffy. But if there were to ever be a definition of it, um, which involves like co-location of military objects with civilian objects or civilians themselves in order to discourage military attack, Hamas has easily met that threshold, or with the intention of gaining a military advantage. Like, I think Hamas has pretty easily met that threshold. If we're to agree with anything that anybody has ever published on anything ever, including Embassy International. Yeah, because there was one slimy move that Jank made with the. He actually did the buzzword in reverse. Usually, people who do these buzzwords do it like they do the hard connotation with the soft denotation. But when it came to, um, I think he, he said to him at one point, "Oh, like Hamas is using uh, human shields." And the slimy move that he did was that, "Oh, come on! Just because they're, you know, they have a weapon and you know some civilian is nearby, oh, you're going to call that a human shield?" It's like, okay, no, you're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. You're clearly, it's not clearly the same thing when you're like, okay, well, they're launching, they're setting up like rocket silos near hospitals, like yeah. that's not <laughs> the same thing. Um, so he actually did the reverse. He did the soft, uh, so he did the hard de uh, denotation, but the soft con connotation yeah. to, to do, flip it around on you. Uh, but yeah, really, so people go go really slimy with these buzzwords. Uh, you, you always have to make sure the denotation is matching the connotation mm -hmm. and point it out hard, like make sure you point it out if someone else is not is doing it when they don't match. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just have to not look unhinged while doing it. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, like, the way you want to make them look, are they going to look? Just, there's there's got to be a way to just make them be the one looking like okay, like you are just doing something clearly slimy here. Like you, you the problem is that it's hard because mm -hmm. people will only see um, people. One, people don't know the history. Two, people don't know anything about international law. So, like for instance, if civilians are dying, it just seems like you're always breaking a law. That must be the case if civilians are dying. Um, and then three, on their side, they can just like point to numbers. Like, well, look at how many people are dying. And in order to invoke, like, well, why is international law of armed conflict important? Or why should Israel be allowed to defend itself? You have to speak about relatively abstract concepts that are solid. I think there's good reasons why nations should be allowed to defend themselves, even if it means other civilians die in the course of that war. There are very strong arguments for it, but it's just rhetorically, if the other side is just going to stand on numbers, it, I'm worried that if that's, if that's the extent of their argumentation, it's like, okay, well, f me, I guess, like, I look unhinged or whatever. Yeah, I think one thing that might help is pointing out examples where they've clearly done the same move. Where who's like, done like, the same move? The, the Rabbi guy, he's like, um, he, he's done the same move with the word, the buzzword anti-Semitic. 
Like he's he's done it in that debate with the. Uh... Oh, that's really that's a really 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 good counterexample because they're very critical of people who bring up um, anti-Semitism all the time or invoke the Holocaust, um, and mm-hmm. rightfully so, is it because it muddies the conversation, it makes it impossible. Um, yeah, well, you point out like, hey, listen, you're do you do this too? You don't realize it, but like, you, rightfully so. Like when people like charge when every time you criticize Israel, like. They're, they do it in a way where it's like they're, they define anti-Semitism in a way that just includes anti-Zionism. It includes anti-Israel crit- crit- criticism. Uh-huh. And there's a way you can define anti-Semitism that does that. You can technically do it, define it that way. There's a way you could do that. Uh-huh. You can stretch the definition of anti-Semitism to include criticism of Israel because, hey, you know, uh, you, you know, Jewish religion like kind of says like, oh, that's, they, have, they have the land of Israel, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, any critique of that is anti-Semitic. Like you can have a definition like that, but the point is you're stretching the definition such that your denotation is now stretched and your connotation is still narrow mm-hmm. you're connotating that you hate jews but the denotation is really just your critical of israel so you realize this the point to say to them is that you do this all the time you're doing i'm just doing the same thing you're doing with a different buzzword yeah um the alpha loop 20 dollars. who's responsible Who's responsible for the living conditions in Gaza, i.e., what has Israel done versus Hamas to improve it? Also, if Hamas gets what they want tomorrow, ceasefire, no walls around Gaza, what does tomorrow row look like? Uh, I mean, who's responsible for the conditions in Gaza? That's, I feel like it's a really hard question. I feel like that's similar to the, like the what's the most important wheel on the car. Um, I mean, like obviously the blockade that Israel has enacted around Gaza is going to affect living conditions somewhat, but Hamas is also the sole administrator, really, truly, to that region. They do misappropriate funds. They do steal money from people. They do steal humanitarian aid. Um, they misappropriate money to building fucking tunnels and building fucking uh, rockets and military shit all day. So, I mean, I would say there's like a shared responsibility there, but Israel's excuse for blockading, I think is much stronger than Hamas's excuse of jihad, I would say. Now, don't you think it would be better epistemically to just appeal to the current um, the current desires for a two-state solution, which in, that neither side really wants it right now. And there are just certain things that would need to have to change rather than doing an analysis of what happened at two decades ago um, <clears throat> in yeah. a completely different environment that is today. <laughs> I mean, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, there's a quote that I really like, though. Uh, History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, and I think there's like patterns that have emerged from 48 onwards for Israel that I think give some indication about what a future like settlement or negotiation would look like with them. And I feel like historically in this region, when sides have relied too heavily on military, like peace has never come about. If a side relies too heavily on on diplomacy, it doesn't come about. It seems like you have to have both arms of these working in conjunction with each other. And right now, Israel is not really willing to do the negotiation part because they don't have to, because they can just point to terrorist attacks. Hamas clearly has no desire whatsoever to do the negotiation part. And the I guess the issue that I have is that internationally, it feels like everybody keeps gassing up the Palestinians to keep fighting when it's just making their cause and case worse and worse and worse and worse. It might affect that ratio of how much you need to rely on military and negotiations uh, in order to push someone into negotiations. It's like if you were at war with a whole bunch of different parties, Mm -hmm. at some some point, different parties are going to cave at different points. When you put military pressure on them, you're like, okay, fine, we need to start, we need to come to the table or we need to relax our demands. It just seems like. Hamas has a very high threshold there. It's like, okay, well, you know, we're getting destroyed, but we're going to just be in denial about it until, like, you know, we're going to black knight it until yeah. the very end. Um, but I wonder, I wonder if it would be different if it felt like, because I think Arab leaders have largely abandoned Palestine. I think that's been the case for a while. I think Arab citizens, it's hard because I'm not on the ground, but it feels like they kind of care, but not really that much, but enough to, like, tweet or protest a little bit and, you know, fuck Jews anyway from these people. But I wonder if the feeling, I wonder if the situation in Palestine would change dramatically if it really felt like there was a ton of external pressure from other Arab states for some sort of peace agreement to be reached. If there, if that like feeling came internationally, rather than like the virtue signaling from a lot of the Arab leaders being like, oh yeah, we definitely condemn Israel as we continue to basically normalize relations in the background. I wonder if Palestinians would feel more pressure to like, okay, well, fuck, we can't keep fighting. We have to like actually aggressively push for peace rather than find every single excuse to say, well, you know, this guy resigned or this guy stopped talking to us or, you know, we didn't have enough time to look at this or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Also, why do people... Sorry, what? Hi. About like a... 
like one per- a person threw a stone or something as the most violent event in the March of Return. <laughs> Because there's, that's Finkelstein. If you ever have a question, just you should never, ever, ever have a question on where did a bad fact about Palestine come from? The answer is always Finkelstein. Um, I think I've heard him say this, and I think I've read this in Inquest in the Martyrdom, um, where his description of the Great March of Return was a ton of people peacefully approaching the wall, and then basically Israeli Call of Duty snipers um, basically get out like a tally board written in Palestinian women's virgins' blood to see how many innocent seven-year-old Palestinian children they can assassinate with their 50 caliber sniper rifles for absolutely no reason than just the, the hatred that is radiating from their bodies for the peaceful people that are marching to escape the concentration camp-like conditions of the genocidal apartheid state that has been inflicted upon. I'm sorry. But basically that, nice. yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Because there was like, they had, the Palestinian side had like, they had snipers and they, they killed people. <laughs> yeah, and they had Molotov cocktail balloons going over and they had, yeah. You know, yeah, like What's there was a actually, cocktail balloon. Um, I, or they, I think they're called incendiary balloons. But I think you oh, get a balloon okay. and you basically load it. I don't know how you make them. I don't know if I'm allowed to say anything. I'm sorry. I don't know if I should. But like, it's, I think they found a way to basically you would float balloons over the wall. This was a strategy for a while. You'd float balloons over the wall that were filled with shit, and when they crash into something, it would basically like kind of explode like a Molotov cocktail. Oh. Yeah, like the, there was gunfire from the Palestinian side as well. It was like like. To frame it as if, like, I mean, look, relatively, like, if, if you look, look if relatively of, of all the conflicts, was the March of Return, like, a, a relatively violent one? No, but that's not really saying much compared to, like, all the violence that has happened in these conflicts. But to classify it as, like, oh, yeah, the, the stone throwing, like, that's what happened. It might have been, um, it might have been, too, I want to say that, because I, I only read this on the Wikipedia, I didn't actually go and read the underlying report, but there might have been a year report as well that said that of the 200 people killed, one of them represented a threat to the IDF, and people might be resting on that too, but I didn't actually read their underlying rationale for that. Um. Well, what, you know, if because if there's at least one bullet that's fired and one Molotov cocktail and one grenade, like, then to say at least one, did that one person throw all of them? Like, because like, otherwise, what are, what are you defining to be a threat? Like, if you're just, con- are you only considering like live fire to be a threat? Are you not considering grenades or incendiaries? To yeah, be that's threat? the like, issue, yeah. The issue is that sometimes I think when, when international communities analyze Israel, uh, or I'm sorry, when international communities analyze Hamas, it seems like they do a very strict application of international law. Um, I think the Goldstone Report is a really good example of this. Where when they analyze Hamas, they'll say something like, um, there was evidence that Hamas was firing rockets or something from neighborhoods. Uh, however, we cannot make a factual determination on whether or not they intended to gain a military advantage by co-locating military and civilian objects here. So we can't really say if they were violating you know, international law of our conflict. So they'll say that, which on a strict reading is actually true, because you do, like if you're just fighting in neighborhoods because that's just where you happen to wind up as you're fighting, but you're not trying to use human shields, it doesn't count actually as like a violation, like a, like a war crime or anything like that. It doesn't count as a violation of law of armed conflict. But then when they look at the Israeli side, they'll go like, but on Israel, they bombed a house, nine people people were here, uh, we looked afterwards and we couldn't find weapons, therefore they're guilty of the war crimes of not obeying proportionality, explicitly targeting civilians, um, not, like all these horrible belligerent war crimes and violations, and it's like, well, hold on, wait, where's the mens rea on the Israeli side? Like, it's very strange that they'll take a very strict application of international law when applied to Hamas and then totally abandon that and make the most dog shit international law uh, analyses when it comes to Israel. It's, ri- it's ridiculous. Another good example of that would be um, comparing cast lead and the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. Um, so in cast lead, the big a big thing that the NGOs and you you in fact finding mission in fact in quotations, uh, essentially their their point was that you know the the civilian ki- kill count is you know plus is much higher because of the targeting of police uh-huh. members. But, you know unless there's either evidence that. There is a systematic incorporation into the military by the police or on an individual level to take it up arms that they are civilians. Now, I actually there's, there's a whole side debate to that with the Orient study, and I, we don't, I don't have to get into that because I actually do think the huge chunk of those police members actually did meet criteria for that. But anyway, with the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia, 40 percent of the militants killed approximately 40 percent were police they systematically targeted police and there was no evidence no good evidence for either of those things mm-hmm. nor when you look at the ngos that, ta- that did the reports on this like this this issue was really not even mentioned except for one mention by human rights watch and they just say like they assume them to be paramilitary like, sure. what is it? yeah <laughs> it's like what like there was a whole analysis 
in, with the UN about like whether they were systematically incorporated in the police. There was a whole debate, like, and they basically like, no, there's no evidence. Uh, that, that they stuck to their ground and be like the human rights are like oh no we assume we assume it's paramilitary for NATO bombing Yugoslavia so they're uh, you know they're militants. Like, yeah, what? they just did a cast lead job. Yeah, the yeah I don't I can't I can't think of it. I don't know why the the I don't I can't explain the disparate treatment. It's really stupid. I don't want to go to the anti-Semitic thing. I'm sure there are like better things uh, in terms of like just because Israel is a strong power because it's a Western country because they've got Western backing and the Palestinians are yeah, such an obvious NATO. what yeah, this is NATO. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm thinking of, like, why the disparate treatment of the analyses of, like, Israeli stuff. I don't, it just seems, like, so wild compared to, like, everything. It's, like, it's Western, but, but NATO's also Western. So you'd have to, like, find a, a difference between NATO and Israel. In Israel. Oh, sure. Um... Because they also hold NATO to a different standard than Israel. Well, maybe because, um, well, because for, like, the bombing of, like, this, like, for the Serbs and Bosnia and shit, like, that was obviously, like, a genocide going on and everything, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe people felt, like, the mission was more righteous because of that? Yeah possible i mean but also like isn't israel also being accused of it oh wait that was kosovo am i mixing up things uh isn't israel it was this was nato bombing of, of kosovo and serbia um and monta and and some areas in montenegro i don't think the serbs were being accused of committing a genocide against kosovo it was the idea was that they were going to if they weren't stopped right yeah so if they had the view that they there would be a genocide that if they didn't stop then People accuse Israel of that all the time. Like, oh, if we don't stop Israel, they'll commit a genocide. They're accusing them of it right now. <laughs> so that might not be a difference. I don't do know. people want to bomb Israel? Like, well, I guess some of them do, right? Uh, well, <laughs> hey. Well, wait, who? Are you mean? Do you mean civilians, leaders, countries? I don't no, think. The, any point, the, the point is, well, look, the, the the breaker, the symmetry breaker here that that was being invoked was that, like, okay, well, maybe it's a more righteous cause, so we can hold. NATO to a, a more lenient standard because they're, you know, they're preventing a, a genocide. But then the question, the question would just be, oh, okay, so I see. It's like, okay, may, I mean, maybe that's true. Um, but like, I don't know, couldn't Israel, but, but couldn't Israel just say the same thing then? Like, hey, if we don't like suppress Hamas, like we'll just get more October 7th and we'll get a genocide. Yeah, but then people <laughs> just compare the numbers on both sides so they don't care. Like, yeah, it seems, I don't know, it seems weak. It's like, because whatever excuse that you can draw for NATO, at least, at least like, preventing a genocide, like, I don't know, I don't know why Israel couldn't say the same thing, if, especially if, like, their their opponent is vowing to do October 7th again and again, and they already did it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, the people who call Israel, like, what they're doing right now, a genocide are the same people who probably think that the that NATO shouldn't have bombed Yugoslavia over Kosovo, even though... Like, the number of Kosovars who were being displaced was literally, like, almost a million. It was, like, 800,000. So, um, like, if they won't want it there, then they won't want it here, right? Uh, yeah, but we're so. Asking, so that's true, but we're asking it with respect to, like, the NGOs and stuff. So, like, the people who are in charge of the NGOs, because the whole thing is, like, the NGOs seem to hold Israel to a different standard than NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. Because there's, like, a whole big thing with the police, with Israel, and, like, they didn't budge on a dime. Uh, not not one of them, and so they, the civilians killed, jacked, jacked up. The militants killed, went all the way, went down by the same amount. And then, like when it came to the, and when it came to the mil, the militants killed in NATO bombing of Yugoslavia, the police force, there was even a higher proportion of of the police force that was killed in the, in the militants in Yugoslavia. It's almost forty percent. They systematically targeted them. It's just, and they did a cast, they did more of a cast lead job than cast lead. And they barely just, they barely, like, only, I only found one NGO that even addressed it, and they just basically said, they literally they said, oh, assumed paramilitary. Like, what? <laughs> Reading these, God, f I'm just Googling, bro, <sighs> Norm lives in, like, shitty quotes. Like, I don't, does, does he, f I'm trying to be personal, I'm sorry. Uh, one argument that I've made a lot uh, when I'm talking to somebody who's knowledgeable is I feel like if you're knowledgeable on a topic, you, you read information, you assimilate it in your brain, and then you create like these cohesive conceptual understandings of things and you speak like that. I feel like I read so many articles by Norm where he's literally like a quote machine. Um, I Googled something about that because I, because I'm trying to find those statements he made on the March of Return. I found the video on it, but then there's another article that he'd written for, um, there's another article that he'd written, and he also does like a great assistant. He repeats a lot of these quotes all the time. Uh, it was an article that he'd written for The Intercept after the March of Return, and he's like, uh, 
Well, it's all, he always uses these same talking points. Now let's return to Gaza. What are the facts about Gaza? Well, and number I one, facts. yeah, I only do, I only do the I only do the facts. Number one, beginning in 2012, the UN, very staid, dull-witted, but competent bureaucrats, uh, or staid, began issuing reports. The first one was in the form of the interrogative. It said, "Will Gaza be livable in 2020?" Then in 2015, another report was issued by UNCTAD, one of the premier UN agencies, and they switched from the interrogative to the declarative. They said Gaza on its current trajectory will not be livable in 2020. Then in 2017, a senior UN official, again, very conservative, proper bureaucrat, said, it seems like our forecasts have been optimistic. Sanguine, he said, Gaza has crossed the threshold of unlivability a long time ago. We're not talking about uh, poetry. We're not talking about hyperbole. We're talking about the assessment, the verdict of very conservative but professional and competent UN bureaucrats. Gaza is in an unlivable space. This was six years ago, by the way. What does that mean concretely? Now, I like how he says this, but what does that mean concretely? Oh, is he about to break down like how it's like unlivable, like are people dying or whatever? And then he says, well, let's take one indicator. 97% of Gaza's water is contaminated. It's unfit for human consumption. Well, what does that mean? Oh, okay, well, at least he's gonna tell us what that means. Well, let's take the opinion of Sarah Roy, who is the world's leading authority on Gaza's economy. Very bright woman, very decent woman. I know it's not relevant, but I'll mention it. Both of her parents were in Auschwitz concentration camp. So consider her language. She said, innocent people, most of them children, because Gaza is overwhelmingly majority children, 51% children, are daily being poisoned. And that's a fact. And people don't want to hear it. They get all squeamish. Why are you talking about concentration camps? Why are you talking about poisoning? Well, hey, don't blame the messenger for the bad news. Concentration camp? That's Baruch Kimmerling, the one guy that we look at the quote of. Poisoned one million children. There are one million children in Gaza that are being poisoned. Israel poisoning one million children. So now let's get back to the question, calling things by their proper names. Are the people of Gaza trying to breach a border fence? No. The people of Gaza are trying to breach an unlivable space in which the population is daily being poisoned. Those are the facts. And we shouldn't recoil from those facts. Like what? Jesus Christ. Ugh. I really do want you to read the part of his book that he say, basically says the rockets are just fireworks in Method and Madness. Do um, you have that book? I don't, but I think he reincorporates a lot of his work into the Inquest into Martyrdom. He might use the... Let me check. In Inquest into Martyrdom, uh, early on on page 15, he says... Um, because Norm's favorite historian to quote is himself, by the way. Uh, of course, if Gaza, quote, would just sink into the sea, end quote, from Nobel Peace Prize laureate uh, Yitzhak Rabin. I like that quote, too, because we look up the source of that quote, too, and Rabin is just talking about the frustrations of dealing with, like, the Palestinian problem. But it's so incredibly intractable and difficult. And he's like, if only it would just sink into the sea. But he uses this as a, uh, as a justification that even Rabin wanted to murder all of the Palestinians. Um, because, the, yeah, the, fuck, God, oh, God. Um, or, if it, or, um, or if it unilaterally surrendered its destiny to Israel caprice, Israel wouldn't brutalize it. But short of these options, Gaza could only exercise as much, that is, as little agency as is allocated to any people held in bondage. The notion that enhanced fireworks emanating from an anthill could, in, in and of themselves, inflect state policy in one of the world's most formidable military powers is laughable. Or would be, would it not, were it not for that power's formidable disinformation apparatus. So that's one. I think he makes four other references to fireworks in his book uh, oh yeah one sec here's another one um the official israeli post-mortem on protective edge alleged that several residential communities on the border with the gaza strip were battered by rocket and mortar fire yet even allowing that a certain percentage of land uh, a certain percentage landed in open areas how could the thousands upon thousands of hamas rockets have inflicted so little damage how could only one israeli house have been destroyed and 11 others hit or damaged by a mega barrage of rockets the obvious and most plausible answer was that the core uh, the preponderance of these so-called rockets amounted to enhanced fireworks or bottle rockets yeah that's the term he uses enhanced fireworks he uses that in method of madness also yeah yeah he develops the argument, but I, I think he just develops the argument for why he thinks they're just enhanced fireworks and just method of madness. I sent you, I sent it to you in, in DMs. Um, it's it's on page. Let's see, I think it's one twenty seven. Yeah, one twenty seven. Uh, although Israel reveled in the the success. Talk to each other for a minute, okay? Oh, what's going on? No. <sighs> okay, no. Fuck you. Oh, I was going to chime in on uh, where exactly you think the big sticking point was for Palestinians in the peace process, because it seems to vary depending on what it, it feels like for a while you were fixed on refugees, but now it seems like we're less sure. 
are, I mean, I feel like it's always, the, the issue is that here's the problem. This is my, this is a very macro level take, is I feel like, I feel like Palestinian leadership has never had a coherent, like, this is what we want, and this is what we're gonna like negotiate towards, and we're gonna try to figure this out. I feel like that's never been crystallized on their end, and they haven't been able to go into negotiations with that crystallization, and then kind of like push in a way to make whatever agreements with Israel. It feels like they're, on their end, it's always been relatively amorphous, because the leadership is trying to maintain political popularity or uh, political cohesion within the Palestinian people, and they don't want to divide anybody or piss anybody off. That's what it. That's what it feels like. Um, so they just kind of like say no for one reason or another, but there's not really any particular issue that they just can't solve, like Jerusalem or refugees or fucking borders. Yeah, or it doesn't feel. It feels like when they go into negotiations, um, it feels like on the like on the Israeli side, it's like okay, well we can give this, we can do this, well, we want to figure out this, or blah blah blah. And on the Palestinian side, it just feels like over and over again, it's like okay, well I see you guys are willing to do that. Um, like we'll get back to you, and like maybe we'll see this, and like oh maybe we'll get back to you, and blah blah blah. But it doesn't it doesn't ever feel like there's like a crystallized like 100 percent like this is what the push is for on the Palestinian side. It feels like that like never materialized. At least under Arafat. Um, I don't know, maybe under Abbas, I'm not sure. Because I noticed uh, you and Joe were arguing about, like, what what exactly does it mean to recognize the right of return but to not do it? Um, I'll give you a poll from 2003. Um, The thing is, is that you do actually get that kind of, like, mixed opinion from Palestinians where they'll say, like 90 plus percent of them will say that right of return is a sacred right and it has to be fulfilled and everyone has the, we have the right to return to Palestine. Mm-hmm. But if you look at um, <clears throat> different groups like uh, Jordanian refugees or the ones in Lebanon or the ones in Gaza and the West Bank, mm-hmm. very few of them actually say that they're going to go to Israel as, as their right of return because technically um, right of return can mean literally 194 back to your home mm-hmm. or it can mean return to Palestine and ones who were... Who, maybe kicked out of like the say like kicked out of Haifa or they left Haifa and then they want to go back well they can go back to Gaza or the West Bank and say that they're in back in Palestine yeah but I think the issue is I think Israel after Taba and I think Olmert in 2008 also agreed um, I think Israel said like listen you guys can have as many people as you want going back to Palestine we might accept Mm -hmm. a few into Israel and we'll make an international fund to compensate you but I think after for instance after Taba I think they explicitly said we are not giving up ever our historic right to return we're not giving that up no one's done that before we're not going to be the first and I'd imagine if it's like the response to the Clinton parameters, they'll also say, like, um, we're never giving up the right, but we're willing to be flexible. And with the implementation, we recognize Israel's demographic concerns, but we're never giving up the right. You know, Something, you, yeah, you know, that's, that, yeah, that kind of yeah, yeah, um, flies into the, like that. Well, what are you actually... Yeah, because I, I will say, I'll give you another poll as well. This is from like, because Palestinians and Israelis were both polled on like the Clinton parameter framework from like 2003 until 2010, like every mm-hmm. year, basically. And... They're asked, like, it's broken up. And so, like, how do you feel about the Clinton parameters when it comes to borders? How do you think it comes down to refugees, Jerusalem, um, security, uh, demilitarized state? And it seems to be that Palestinians will, they don't tend to have a majority favorable opinion of the refugees thing. Usually it's at, like, 40, 45 percent. Sometimes it's lower, depending on what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, But it seems to be that the consistent thing that they definitely don't like is the demilitarized state. That's the one that constantly gets below thirty percent in the polls. Do you really think so? Well, yeah. Well, this is what the, uh, this is from PSR, so it's like here. This is something that I've I've been softer on. I don't care as much about. I don't know if I care as much about polls um, because I think I I read a convincing argument. I kind of agree that like a civilian population might think a certain thing, but when something like novel or revolutionary comes before them, that political conditions and social conditions on the ground can change very, very, very fast. So like, for instance, a huge stickle point or a stickling, stick, sticking point, uh, sorry, a huge sticking point for um, for Israelis might be like the old city of Jerusalem or some shit. Or they might say that like, we want a unified East Jerusalem. This is, we're never giving up an inch of this to Palestinians, okay? But if it was the case that tomorrow, like Hamas disbanded, all the hostages were freed or whatever, and like the PA came to Israel and they negotiated something similar to like, say, like uh, at the end of Taba Summit, where they're like, listen, we're gonna cut East Jerusalem on ethnic lines and a lot of the Palestinians stay here, but we have a peace plan, all the PLO, all the entire the PA everybody's on board with this and we're ready to sign it. We'll do it tomorrow. I think that mm-hmm. the opinion on the ground I think would change very quickly. There'd be a bit of upheaval, but I think like if something like that was ironed out, I think people would be like, oh, you know what? Fuck it. Okay. And I think that public opinion would change to match. That'd be my guess. Um, 
Yeah, that's probably true. Um, but I think also when you have polling data like that, that's kind of consistent over a period of, I guess, in this case, it's seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's kind of like confirming what I would say is that, like, I think for in exchange for a state, people in Gaza and the West Bank would absolutely cede right return. They would not give a f because it's not them, right? Sure. And the refugees just sadly have less say. And even the refugees, if they were said, like, you can return to, you can go and live in the West Bank and get full citizenship. If you're a refugee living in Lebanon, like, you're not going to say no to that. Like, what the fuck? Um, if, like, if they get that as a whole. Sure. Oh, shit. Why are you coming on my phone? Jesus. Yeah. Right. Uh, why wouldn't I come on your phone? Don't ask. Don't, not in front of the chat. You wait. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me do... Close this. You said methods and madness. Yeah, I, I gave you. I sent it in the in your DM. No, oh, okay. Hold on. The PDF. He start. He starts it on page one twenty seven. He starts developing the uh, enhanced fireworks argument. Oh, him actually developing an argument instead of just like quoting the headline from a news story. I'm excited. Oh, well, I mean. <laughs> You said, wait, wait, don't spoil, no spoiler. Okay, you said on page 127? Yeah, 127 it starts. So. Wait, why the fuck does the browser version of Kindle not give me page numbers? You're really gonna do this to me? Can you control, can you control F? Um, Are you able to do that? Yeah, okay, give me the sentence. Although Israel reveled in the success of its newly deployed Iron Dome anti-missile defense system. Got it, all right. <clears throat> The armed resistance Hamas put up during the eight-day Israeli assault was largely symbolic. Although Israel reveled in the sense uh, in the success of its newly developed or newly deployed Iron Dome anti-missile defense system, it almost certainly did not save many, perhaps not any, lives. During Castle, some 925 quote-unquote rockets and an additional number of mortar shells landing in Israel killed three Israeli civilians. While during Pillar of Defense, some 850 quote-unquote rockets and an additional number of mortar shells landing in Israel killed four Israeli civilians. It is unlikely that in the main and allowing for the aberration, Hamas used more sophisticated weapons during pillar of defense. Through its army of informers and its state-of-the-art aerial surveillance, Israel would have been privy to any large quantities of technically sophisticated Hamas weapons and would have destroyed these stashes before or during the first day of the attack. It is also improbable that Netanyahu would have risked an attack just on the eve of an election if Hamas possessed weapons capable of inflicting significant civilian casualties. A handful of Hamas projectiles did reach deeper inside Israel than previously, but these lacked explosives. An Israeli official derisively dismissed them as pipes, basically. If Israel ballyhoed Iron Dome, I don't even know what that word means, it was because its purported effectiveness was the only achievement to which Israel could point in the final reckoning. The last act of pillar defense came when Israel hit up against a tactical dead end. On the one hand, it had struck all pre-planned military targets, but on the other, it couldn't directly target the civilian population. Hamas had successfully adapted Hezbollah's strategy of continually firing its projectiles, the psychological upshot of which was that Israel couldn't declare its deterrence capacity had been restored, forcing on it a ground invasion to stop the projectile attacks. Israel could not, however, launch such an invasion without suffering heavy combatant losses unless it blasted everyone and everything in and out of sight as it cleared a path into Gaza. But because of the novel circumstances, the regional realignment after the Arab Spring in Turkey under Erdogan, the threat of a mega goldstone, as an Israeli commentator put it, the presence of a foreign press corps embedded, not in the IDF, but among the people of Gaza. Israel couldn't I'll launch a... What? I'll pause you, I'll, I'll pause you there because his, his argument gets further, to, does stops being developed now and start, restarts being developed 20 pages later. <laughs> Oh. Um, Israel couldn't just, launch a murderous cast lead style ground invasion. It was caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. Nice. So his argument picks up, uh, if you control off the notion that Hamas fired thousands of rockets at Israel. It's on page 145, but you don't have pages. So if you control off the notion that Hamas fired thousands of rockets at Israel. Let's see. The notion. Mm-hmm. The notion that Hamas fired. Yeah, I see. Got it. <clears throat> In broad strokes, then, and allowing for the occasional exception. 
The picture prior to Protective Edge was this. Hamas had no rockets in its armory, no allies from whom to acquire them, no way to smuggle them in, and no wherewithal to manufacture them. The notion that Hamas fired thousands of rockets at Israel and had thousands more still hidden away, while it was the miracle of the Iron Dome that spared Israel from devastation, is almost certainly a fiction. Dismissing Israel's Iron Dome hoopla, MIT missile defense expert Theodore Postel estimated that fewer than 10% of Iron Dome's intercepts were successful, and he ascribed the fewness of Israel's civilian casualties to its sophisticated civil defense system and the smallness of the warhead on Hamas rockets, 10 to 20 pound range. But this hypothesis- now, citation, citation 29. Now, if you go to 29, oh you expect find Theodore Postal there, right? Yeah. Uh oh. Wait, that is right. him, right? No, it's not. <laughs> Wait, are you sure? <laughs> go to citation 29. Cause like, look, any normal person reading this, you go to citation 29, oh, that should totally be Theodore Postal's work then. The MIT guy you're citing for this. Wait, so, it is. Is your book flawed? Wait, 29. Yeah, 29 is Matthew Kalman. Israel Israel set war plan more than a year ago. San Francisco Chronicle. Are you um are you using a Kindle or something else? Oh, I'm using another one. Hold on, never mind. Yeah, cuz I just went on here does go to Theodore Postal. Oh, it's the one on Kindle. Oh, the one on Kindle so much better than. Okay, my thing is messed up. Never mind, that actually is that actually is. Okay, so that is his argument. But notice the, but actually go to Theodore Postal then. Notice actually, wait, no to what? Go to go to what he's Theodore Postal. Actually, so we'll actually, no, f finish, complete the argument, and then we'll go through the whole thing. Sure. Hold on. I open the Theodore argue, uh, article. Um, okay, good, back good, to good. here. Let's see. But this hypothesis would not yet account for the minimal infrastructural damage Israel witnessed if Iron Dome did not disable 3,500 of the 3,900 incoming Hamas rockets. Wouldn't total property damage from even small warheads exceed 15 million? The only plausible explanation is that Hamas rockets consisted overwhelmingly of enhanced fireworks. Initially, Israel grossly inflated the threat posed by Hamas's projectiles to justify its campaign of terror bombing. However, its pretext backfired when the projectiles kept coming and, among other things, Israel's tourism industry took a big hit. When a Hamas projectile landed in the vicinity of Ben Gurion Airport, prompting international airlines to suspend flights to Israel, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg obligingly flew over in order to reassure prospective travelers. But if all was well in Israel because of Iron Dome, then why was Israel pulverizing Gaza? Not missing a beat, Israel conjured a new rationale, quickly aped by credulous and apologetic journalists, Hamas's terror tunnels, which exist solely to annihilate our civilians and to kill our children. But this pretext also backfired when Israel evacuees recoiled at the prospect of returning to their border communities, so some Israelis... Uh, eventually conceded that the targets of Hamas fighters infiltrating via tunnels were Israeli soldiers, not civilians, spewing forth one lie after another. Israel yeah. kept catching itself in the tangled web of its deceits. He, he completed the argument. So, I mean, his, his, his argument is twofold. So the first first part is that, okay, look, if you compare, if you take a look at cast lead before Iron Dome, if you look at the number of rockets fired and you look at the number of, ro uh, of casualties, of, of deaths, from rockets fired. If you look at that ratio, and then you look at protective edge after Iron Dome, and you do the same ratio, it's it's basically the same. You know, so that so it's indicating like it really it basically made no difference. What wait? What made then, no difference for his Iron Dome? Okay, because he's saying before and at pre Iron Dome and post Iron Dome. So we what he does to get the pre Iron Dome ratio is he just looks at the cast lead time frame, uh -huh. which is like. You know, both of these time frames are like a month and or like three weeks. One is three weeks, the other is like a month and change. So then he then he goes to protective and he compares that to protective edge, rockets fired to uh casual to deaths from rockets, and he says, Okay, well the ratios are about you know, they're roughly around the same. They're like three hundred rockets per death or something like that. Mm -hmm. They're like, Okay, well doesn't that mean the Iron Dome didn't do anything? Then he says, Okay, and now I'm also gonna cite Theodore Postal from MIT who basically says like he, he's disputing he says only 10% of the interceptions were successful but when you actually read so there's a couple of things here so okay so so then then Theodore Postal attributes the the issue uh, the issues with uh, ec with economic damage now, now Finkelstein doesn't even agree with Theodore Postal here he's like okay no he's wrong about that too that's there's it wasn't economic damage because he wants to maintain that they don't do anything mm-hmm so there's a couple of things. So first off, just just pulling cast lead and protective edge out is basically the same sort of move that like a global warming denier does when they just put two snippets of a chart out of the entire like out of the entire temperature CO2 relationship. It's like, oh look, we found here's an area where like 
CO2 goes up and temperature goes down. No, you want to look at the entire data set is what you want to do. Sure. If you're going to compare pre-Iron Dome and post-Iron Dome, like, look at all the numbers. Don't just, like, pick out two periods of time which, A, lasted, like, a month out of, like, out of, like decades pre and post. Mm -hmm. And then also was in, like, the height of a combat when civilians would be more alert and more ready to take shelter. Yeah, that rocket. makes sense. But especially because a lot of these rockets are, they don't have like the damage to actually like, if you're in your house and one of these rockets hit a house, you're probably not going to die, right? It just kind of blows up your roof or whatever. Uh, I mean, it can, it can kill you. But really, they have like, they have these, um, so they have these designated areas where they can go into like, not just a house, but um, like uh, a designated area that's more protected from uh, from a rocket uh, where you're even even safer. So they like a shelter. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like a bomb shelter. So they're, they're, the point is, like, during these active conflicts, it, rather than periods of relative lows, the civilians are at a more heightened state of alert and are more ready to do that. And so, yeah, I mean, there were very few deaths during cast lead and protective edge from rocket, rocket attacks. That's true. Not A, it was a month. One, one was three weeks and change, one was a month and change. And B, like, yeah, that's active combat. Most of the, the vast majority of the deaths had nothing to do from rockets had nothing to do with cast letter protective edge yeah and actually now that i think about it i think in protective edge i think a lot of those villages near the gaza strip weren't they literally fleeing i think like people actually fled some of those villages that were close to the close to the gaza oh, yeah. strip in fear. Yeah, there's, there's commonly displacement also mm -hmm. there, there's displacement near look there's still displacement in the current conflict as well uh the, there's the, the those areas are all like there's like like I don't know how many there's like hundreds of thousands of Israeli c civilians that are just still internally displaced because they they don't want to be near the areas where the rockets are. So yeah, there's all these factors during these active combats where it's like okay, civilians are doing over and above measures to protect themselves from rockets, and you're just selecting those periods of time where that's not going to happen. But the main point here is when you actually do, and today I just corrected those numbers and expanded the data set. Um, so here's my new tweet on that with the, the full data set. So I did it. I looked at all the year from 2001 to uh, the current to January 2024. I'll DM that to you. Uh -huh. I sent it. And when you actually look at the full data set, uh, you get the total pre Iron Dome uh, rockets to rocket deaths. The ratio is 243, so around 243 rockets per uh, rocket death. And then post Iron Dome at 643. So it's about a 265% increase in the number of rockets required to kill a civilian post Iron Dome. And also, Iron Dome is improving over time. And we'll get to the Theodore Postal point on that. Yeah. So the, the technology is not just like Iron Dome deployed, same technology throughout. Like, no, like as time goes on, like the Iron Dome gets upgraded. Mm -hmm. Also, and I would like to point out too that the um, the rockets coming from Gaza have been upgraded as well. They're it's also not... upgraded. That's, that's true as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although the Iron Dome is getting upgraded more than the, the numbers pan out to the Iron Dome being upgraded more than the rockets are. Sure, yeah. So, so like, if you look at 2015, because remember, Theodore Postles pointed out some issues with the Iron Dome in 2014. So, 2015 and above, the ratio was 703. So, 300% in the number of rockets compared to the pre-Iron Dome levels. And then for the current conflict, it's actually 800, so 330% increase. Uh -huh. So what was the whole Theodore Postal thing that Finkelstein was citing? Well, the Postal point was, he says 10% were only 10% were successful interceptions. However, if you actually read what Finkelstein is citing, he defines, Postal is defining a successful interception is it has to be a head-on geometric collision that destroys the warhead. So if it's not a head-on collision, if it just hits the tailpipe, even if it's aimed at a city and it ends up landing at a, in a field, Postal does not consider that a successful interception. Even if that just, like, that could save 10 lives or whatever, like, and now zero, zero die because it landed in a field instead. Mm -hmm. He would consider that not a successful interception. Now, maybe, I mean, so, again, it's the buzzword thing, denotation, connotation. It's like, okay, well, when you define it that way, sure. But that's not what we care about. Like, if, like, surely that's better. Like, sure, if we want to improve the system, fine. Hit it head on, destroy the warhead. Don't land it anywhere, even in an open field. But what that point may work if, like, 
they're, Hamas is launching rockets randomly at a random direction toward Israel, but they're not. They're not playing spin the bottle with the rocket. Like, they're aiming it at cities. They're aiming it at densely populated populations. Yeah, they're not precision guided, but they're, it's clear where they want to hit, or where they're at least trying to. And so, yeah, if you have an Iron Dome system that hits the tailpipe of a rocket instead of a head-on geometric collision, like, oh, fine, do that. Let it, let it, let it not reach the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, interesting, I say, huh? Yeah, so he, he he's citing these like if he's it's almost like it's it's a reliance on people not like actually going and reading the things he's citing because it's like once you read that and be like okay well if that's how you're defining it it's like okay that, that really doesn't support your point <laughs> and the numbers don't either like the numbers just and I think he's the only quote unquote academic who still argues this point I think like everyone else I'm not sure if there's anyone else who hasn't gone silent about this because there used to be critics critiques of the Iron Dome. Uh-huh. And they all have sort of fell, fallen silent. I think Finkelstein is like the only one who hasn't at this point. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I'm just reading through this thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like he, he just he needs to maintain that belief that like rockets are harmless. Like rockets are good. Rockets, fireworks, symbolic. Yay. Which is an insane belief. Like this is just wild. Jesus. I don't know if we'll get into Iron Dome interception, yeah. but yeah, okay, yeah. If you, yeah, if you do, like, yeah, just have that data ready. Uh-huh. Um, okay. Are there any other, do you think, are there any other broad points or anything you think we should keep in mind? Or narrow points, I guess? Um, narrow points, I mean, you know relative risk. Don't, try not to play into civilian casualty ratio if you know about relative risk. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I know it's annoying to explain that to people, but I think, but I don't think you're explaining it to someone like Jank, who like an, an, who has become just an unhinged lunatic lately. Um, because he's going to try to pin you in terms of like he does this a lot. He's like, oh well, Israel should be like this a thousand times over because look how many more civilians they killed. Like he always does that. He always does that move, and that whole thing needs to be shut down. Like that's like okay, well that's only true if someone is committed to like. The, their criteria for this is like you've killed this number of civilians like in any and all contexts yeah like, it's like no that's just a five-year-old analysis mm-hmm. yeah i agree okay yeah so that and then just yeah he, he's a just make sure he actually addresses and answers your questions which is easy to do because he's a slow talker yeah um, i've got time to sit and take notes and like rewrite yeah you know, over and over again now yeah. Yeah, and just like keep pinning him because he's like really weaselly with some some things especially when he doesn't want to answer a question but like give some vaguely related answer that doesn't actually answer the question. Um, well, here's the, like, well, do you support, uh, do you support Israel's use of the Iron Dome? Well, here are the facts. The facts are that the Iron Dome was deployed in this and this date, and this one, uh, just like, a, and they'll go on just like, wait a minute. Uh-huh. Like he does, and, you know, he won't do it on something like that because he probably wouldn't have a problem answering that question, but... When he doesn't like to answer a question, he does that move. Like, he's really slimy there. Yeah, I'm aware, yeah. Yeah, pin him down. Okay. Anything from you, Loner? Oh, no, I was just um, miles away, sorry. When is the debate happening? Is happening tomorrow? Uh, day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. All right, well, good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, take care. All right. All right. Later. Oh, I was just going to mention to you, I don't know if you, I know you were talking about the how Finkelstein was kept appealing to those three quotes when it comes to concentration camp. You were watching that video with Mark, uh, Mark Hill, and Mark Hill actually calls him out and asks him about those quotes and how would he describe it himself instead of appealing to those three quotes if you keep watching the video you'll see his response just thought you would think thought you'd uh, find that interesting oh okay now watch Thanks. Bye. A-U-L-D. and one of the things he accused captain old of oh, having God. done was anybody familiar with for example the warsaw ghetto will know that even amidst the most extreme despondence and poverty there's always a class of people who managed to figure out how to make do and live it up. Right. It, it, that's an important distinction to make. You're, you're not saying that it's inaccurate that there are people who are living lavishly. You're saying that there's a small, isolated population. 
Yes. And their concentration camp. Uh, yes. Okay. And now you're going to find a memorandum from March 2004. And if you scroll down to number 12, paragraph 12, you're going to see Ghira Island. And how does he describe Gaza? Concentration camp. A huge concentration camp. Yeah. Well, Mr. Hughes, here is my question to you. <clears throat> Ghira Island was the head of Israel's National Security Council. He made... He yeah. said the epidemics in the south of Gaza are a good thing. He said that we have to keep up even when they start, keep up, even when the international community starts showing pictures of those incubators with babies dying in it. This is Kiara Island. So obviously, he he's, not, he's, not, he's not a war dove, but he's not an anti-Zionist. Right, he's not in my camp. <laughs> he said that. Don't, do you think that Mr. Island has an agenda like Norman Finkelstein? Mr. Island is a completely bestial, knowledgeable, but bestial character in the past few weeks. And he was roughly the same. Ecuador, Gaza. Right. right. So why is it, why is it that Mr. like Gaza, where people went to the mall, they had burgers and fries at McDonald's, and every once in a while, they went on a European vacation. It's an interesting thing since nobody can go out of Gaza. Right. And there's no airport. And there's no airport. It's, it's a fascinating argument. How, how, that, how that occurred. Let me take one last person. Israel's leading authority, probably the leading authority in the world on life in Gaza. Sarah Roy is the leading authority on the economics of Gaza. I think I can claim, it's a tiny distinction like the tallest building in Wichita, Kansas, but I can claim to have the most knowledge of the political history of Gaza. But the, person, the person with life experience and a stepson to this woman, daughter of survivors of the Nazi Holocaust, oh hyper, whether concealed or openly, justify any suffering that does not reach the climax, which we, the Jews, define, meaning she's against those who say, it's not the Holocaust. It's terrible, it's awful, but it's not the Holocaust. Right. And so, a life of depression, a life of contaminated water and soil, and dependence on ever-dwindling charity. And that is even without the military bombings and incursions, the mowing of the lawn, which we'll get to in a moment. Absolutely. Bergen-Belsen, as a prisoner's camp, and thereafter as a concentration camp, and extermination camp for Jews, it was dismantled after about four years of existence, with the defeat of the Third Reich. The concentration camp that is Gaza has existed under even ever, excuse me, I have to be careful with the words. The concentration camp that is Gaza has existed under ever harsher conditions for almost three decades. Contrary to Israeli propaganda, it was created, assuming good faith by Coleman Hughes, and he's not just pandering to his subscribers, assuming good faith. I would want to know, why would uh, Piara Island call it a huge concentration camp? Why would... Bro, it market. takes this guy forever to make a point. Or play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, oh, what he does. Uh, Amira has called a giant concentration camp. That just genuinely perplexes me. But, but let's, and, what I don't want them to do, what, what one could argue, if I were to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. is that, uh, well, two things. One, you're appealing to authority, uh, and you're appealing to the expertise and analysis of people who you otherwise would be dismissive of. Um, but also, that they could just be wrong. Oh, shit. What a great point. I love the smart guy. I think I super disagree with him over, over a lot of this stuff. But what a smart dude. Good good question. Okay. If we, if we don't appeal to authority, if we don't, instead we actually dissect the argument itself, what are the conditions that, that must be in place to satisfy the conditions of being a concentration camp? And then the subsequent question would be, does Gaza meet that standard? And the reason why I ask this is not to just engage in kind of philosophical exercise, although I think it, for me it'd be worth it just on its own, but because this is a consistent debate and challenge that we see emerge in the Palestinian movement, the pro-Palestinian movement, is if we say that uh, Israel is an apartheid state, people will say, no, it's nothing like South Africa. If people say, well, it's a genocide, people will say, well, look, the population is growing and it's nothing like... Uh, 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 it's, 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 nothing, it's, nothing, it's nothing like Cambodia. It's nothing like uh, Uganda at times. It's nothing like Congo. It's not, in fact, just any place where uh, our recently uh, <laughs> deceased former Secretary of State has been, you might fill in the blank there. It's not like any of those places, but instead, uh, it's different. And, and, and that by using the language of concentration camp, we're smuggling in uh, yeah, an agenda, and a very specific one, though, right? Not just an agenda, but a specific one, right? Which is to demonize the Jewish state, which is to frame them as Nazis, part two, which is to ignore uh, the complexities of the region. So I would say, First, what makes you know, one of the remember one of the things I say if you want to um, if you really want to have an understanding of any topic you should be able to argue both sides pretty well ideally better than anybody argue with his steel man here for the opposition is very good this is an incredibly accurate steel man um, and he hits it on multiple points too he's steel manning not just the factual claim of like well you know is it actually a concentration camp what even amounts to a concentration camp camp he's also steel manning the um, he's steel manning like the uh, I guess the contextual disagreements are the moral baggage that people are accusing of being smuggled in as well with the concentration camp words. So it's good. It's a good steel, man. These double barrel questions, forgive me, because I, but I have to do this. I really get this type of space with you. If you look at 10,000 videos of me now on YouTube, so if you want to say something interesting, then you have to ask me the tough questions. Fair enough. I'll just, I'll just be repeating myself. Right, which is not interesting, right? So, I, I, so, so then the question comes, right, what makes a concentration camp a concentration camp? Outside of someone, outside of someone else saying, I think it's a concentration camp, because we certainly wouldn't agree. If they, if they disagree, we wouldn't be appealing to them. And then the second question is, which is in some sense a praxis driven question, is what, is, what are we afforded? And what do we lose when we draw that type of comparison with the apartheid, with the concentration camp, with the genocide, with the ethnic cleansing, these types of... Oh, what is oh I love that he... Um, I like that he... That's so interesting. His question there is he breaks it down, actually, in the same two important components that I do on all of these as well. Um, so, like, whenever I'm asking on any section here about the types of words we use... 
Um, oh shit, where is it? Oh, here. Apartheid, genocide, refugee camp, right? There's like two parts to like how we utilize a word. One is like on the factual ground, and then the second is he says praxis, because he's a fucking Marxist, but it's, uh, it's the factual part and it's also the ethical part. Like what is the factual sig significance of what we're talking about? What is the moral significance of what we're talking about when we utilize uh, the terminology in this way? So it's, he's looking at both ends too, which is good. I think, I think this really wouldn't be appealing to them. And then the second question is, which is in some sense a praxis driven question is, what, is, what are we afforded? And what do we lose when we draw that type of comparison, whether it's apartheid, whether it's concentration camp, whether it's genocide, whether it's ethnic cleansing, these types of, uh, whether it's pogrom, uh, what, what do we get from that? Okay, uh, very good questions. And I'm glad you're playing what's a critical role in trying to achieve truth, which is playing the role of the devil's advocate. Yes. Um, when we want to figure out whether what's happening, say, in Gaza is a genocide, there are, you can look at a dictionary, but then it's one person's definition, one person's interpretation of the definition versus another. So what is normally done? You'll know because you've done it. You call in experts. People oh, God, no, please tell me he's going to engage with it. Norm... Does Norm not consider himself an expert? I'm so curious. Like, because I call him a pop historian to be mean. Does he not consider himself an expert on the matters of Israel-Palestine, even though he's dedicated decades of his life, at least 20 years, to the study, at least 30 years, to the study of this conflict? Could you imagine if I brought on Benny Moore? It's like, Benny, tell me what you think about this or that. And he's like, well, Abby Schleim says this. Um, well, actually, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna quote this book here, and uh, I, well, if you look at this uh, New York Times article here, and it's like, Benny, you're a fucking historian. No, tell me what you think. What is what is your research tell you? Tell me in your words. What, why the fuck are you quoting other people? You're a historian. Tell me, <laughs> like you tell me from your own mouth. People who claim a certain professional expertise in genocide to um, parse the term, it's a legal term, and whether it applies in the case of, say, the present moment, Gaza. The second thing we look for when we evaluate evidence, it's what's called in law evidence against interest. If you said, I didn't kill my wife, okay. That's not going to carry the day if you're being accused of murder. However, if you said, I did kill my wife, as a matter of fact, I'm very happy. Hold on. He's being provided the opportunity to explain why he believes a particular thing that, uh, you know, hitherto he's only given quotations of. And now his defense is going to be, well, if we were to try to figure out what's true, we would just quote experts and look for conflict of interest? There is no way that he actually thinks that those are the only two things you need to do to understand something. I cut him off, so he's gonna, maybe he'll give a better explanation. That would be astounding. One person's interpretation of the definition versus another. So what is normally done? You'll know because you've done it. You call in experts, people who claim a certain professional expertise in genocide to um, parse the term, it's a legal term, and whether it applies in the case of, say, the present moment, Gaza. The second thing we look for when we evaluate evidence, it's what's called in law, evidence against interest. If you said, I didn't kill my wife, okay? That's not going to carry the day if you're being accused of murder. However, if you said, I did kill my wife, as a matter of fact, I'm very happy I did. Well, it's poss possible that you're legally insane, and that's why you right. said it. But that's evidence against interest, and therefore it carries much more weight in a court of law and a court of public opinion. So what did I do when I gave my three examples? Right. I can claim, I can pull off the shelf right now a definition of concentration camp, as many people have done in the course of... I don't even know if that's necessarily true. We, it, the presumption is innocence for anybody in criminal court, obviously, because you're in court. Obviously, you're innocent. If you were guilty and you plead guilty, you don't go to court. So if you say, I'm innocent, it's not because you're biased towards yourself that the court discredits your opinion. It's not that you have a, a an interest against the court. It's that you're presumed innocent. Of course, by virtue of going to court, Every single utterance, every motion, every witness you call, every single thing is you saying, I'm innocent, here's why. I'm innocent, here's why. I mean, if you say, I'm guilty, well, then of course you're guilty. Then you play guilty. Your presumption of innocence is gone and you're just guilty. It's like he's saying that like, well, if a friend testifies against me, that that evidence is stronger than if, um, than if an enemy testifies against me. Is th There's no shot in criminal court like, I'm sure that a jury might subjectively weigh some things like kind of true, but there's no way that a, that a, there's no way that a, in a cross exam, you could be like, well, aren't you friends with this guy? And the guy's like, yeah. And he's like, so wouldn't you lie to protect him? Well, no, but you are friends with him, right? Yeah. <laughs> I rest my case, jury. Conflict of interest. No shot. I think it's a historian's heuristic, not a legal standard. Okay, well, he used a legal example as like the analogy here. I'm sure that as, I'm sure that, by the way, going away from court, I'm sure that as a heuristic, 
this is a good heuristic to use. I use it, everybody uses a heuristic. If you're gonna advocate against your own interests um, versus advocating in favor of them, we would obviously look for a, a conflict of interest. That's completely fair and totally true. I wouldn't use that as a criminal court standard, and I definitely wouldn't use that to figure out complicated matters of like, is X, Y, or Z a concentration camp? That like That is a wholly and unbelievably inappropriately weird standard to use here. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't tell you if anything's true or not. What? I three examples. Right. I can claim, I can pull off the shelf right now a definition of concentration camp, as many people have done in the course of trying to prove me wrong or prove me right. They've pulled off the Merriam-Webster's definition, and they say, well, as a matter of fact, Finkelstein is correct. A concentration camp is the... Um, uh, Why would we ever go to a... I don't understand. Why would we go to the dictionary for a definition on genocide? It, genocide is... We, this is an international law term. Why wouldn't we, like, look at the actual like internationally recognized legal terms about genocide. Why wouldn't we look at like actual like the conference of genocide? Why would we look at like the international criminal court definition of genocide? We have a whole ass fucking book, a whole ass book that these guys took the time to write to give us the exact elements to meet the threshold of committing the crime of genocide for an individual. Why would we ever, why would you ever reference a, a dictionary when you have a convention and you've got actual international criminal standards for it. He said concentration camp definition. I think he said genocide because concentration camp isn't barely even gonna have a definition, did he? That's why you said it. But that's evidence against interest. And therefore it carries much more weight in a court of law and the court of public opinion. So what did I do when I gave my three examples? Right. I claim, I can pull off the shelf right now a definition of concentration camp, as many people have done in the course of trying to prove me wrong or prove me right. They've pulled off the Merriam-Webster's definition, and they say, well, as a matter of fact, Finkelstein is correct. A concentration camp is the um, oh, he does uh, coercive... Oh, Never mind, he does say He must have done said earlier. Fuck it. Uh, enforce a coercive containment of people in a limited space, and technically he's correct. But I didn't do that. I didn't use the dictionary style. I didn't just pull off. I tried to do something else. Number one... False alarm. Sound the molding alarm. We could say at the very least for the head of uh, uh, Israel's national security establishment, the island, that as that occupying that position and also being Jewish, and here it's not an irrelevant fact, he would know what the concentration camp is. And <laughs> what? Be First of all, hold on. Was Island in a concentration camp? Or does he just have, do all Jews have like imbued in them like knowledge and information of concentration camps? Well, this guy was born in 1952. Uh, were their camps run a lot later in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Or <laughs> what does he mean by that statement? I'm sorry, maybe I misheard again. My bad, let me go back. Correct, but I didn't do that. I didn't use the dictionary style. I didn't just pull off. I tried to do something else. Number one, we could say at the very least for the head of uh, uh, Israel's national security establishment, the Arab island, that as that occupying that position and also being Jewish, and here it's not an irrelevant fact, he would know what the concentration camp is. And you can assume, because he's such a right-wing fanatical, if I can use the term, I don't particularly like it, but fanatical Zionist, you can assume he wouldn't use that word in a glib fashion to describe Palestinians. And yet, knowing the situation as he does, that locution immediately leapt to mind. It's a huge concentration camp. There's nothing to argue here. This is such an unbelievably horrible thought process. His, his, his thought process is just so bad. It's... Like, let's say that we're having an argument over two people see a thing, okay? And one person wants to argue that this is a car, and one person wants to argue that this is a horse. And I'm trying to figure out, like, well, who's correct? My thought process would be, okay, this guy says it's a car. His expertise are, you know, he's an automobile expert on whatever the fuck, you know. Um, this guy over here says it's a horse. Uh, you know, he claims that he is also an automobile expert. Oh, okay, they've got similar uh, areas of expertise. Okay, well, the first thing I would do is probably go, okay, well, is there like an internationally recognized definition like of a car and a horse, right? Oh, okay, well, these things have actual real meanings in the real world that we all get together. With. Okay, cool, so we have that separate, okay? Well, but we still have a matter of disagreement between the car guy and the horse guy. Okay, well, now this is where me and Norm diverge. Okay, well, we have disagreements. Well, what do they actually say about cars and horses. Okay, well this guy up here, he says that um, he says that a car 
uh, it, you know, is a, is a slang for automobile thing powered by an engine, usually has anywhere from two to four wheels, depending on what type of particular car thing you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay. I'm looking at his underlying arguments. I see that they, they seem to roughly comport with my layman's understanding of what this is. These arguments make, se make sense, sure, okay? And then this guy who says it's a horse, um, well, he says that, you know, they have engines and, you know, engines have horsepower. And if you've got a thing that carries you around with lots of horsepower, it must be a horse. Well, that's interesting. That doesn't seem to jive well with at least my layman's understanding of what a horse is. May, are there other experts that also support this particular argument that make this? No, all right, well, that's kind of weird. I don't think I believe this guy. But Norm would cite to this guy. He would say, I believe the horse guy. Okay, Norm, well, tell me, how do you arrive at that conclusion? Well, first I would see if the horse guy stands to gain any money by declaring this thing a horse. And I would see that, well, <laughs> the Jewish horse guy, he actually owns an automobile plant. So he stands to gain a lot of money, or he stands to gain no money. It's actually against his interest to call this thing a horse. So uh, that's a very big deal. Um, I see that that, I see that in his interest, yeah. And also he's an expert. And that's it. Are we really gonna make it through this entire video? This is a 34 and a half, this is a 40, or I'm sorry, it's almost a 35 minute video with the majority of the contents are about that substack that took us like four minutes to read. And he's not going to engage with a single factual analysis of leveraging the term concentration camp? It's just gonna be an analysis of like, well, who said it and what are their incentives? By the way, he's not even giving us the context for these quotes, of which when I look up all three of them, none of the context of the quotes even really supports what he's saying. They weren't doing like a factual analysis of like, are these things concentration camps? Um, the Gira Island guy was just basically saying like, oh yeah, the Gaza Strip, the Gaza Strip that's basically a, a concentration camp. We need to figure out what to do with this as, as we negotiate with Egypt and figure out peace and blah, blah, blah. That was it. It was one passing reference. Um, talking in a, in a memorandum where he's basically uh, talking about what their negotiations, I think, with Egypt for peace should look like, right? Currently, he said, there are 11 million people in Israel, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and that number will increase to 36 million in 50 years. The area between Be'er Shiva and the northern tip of Israel, including the West Bank and Gaza, has the highest population density in the world. Gaza alone, he said, is already a huge concentration camp with 1.3 million Palestinians. Moreover, moreover, the land is surrounded on all three sides, or on three sides by deserts. Palestinians need more land, and Israel uh, can ill afford to cede it. The solution, he argued, lies in the Sinai Desert. It's not even like a big analysis. Actually, wait, hold on. I'm curious. Let me make sure I understand this exactly. Is he not even the one saying concentration camp? Concentration camp. I don't think Island is the one writing this. I think this is being written by somebody different, right? In a series of meetings with Goy <laughs> of officials between March 26th and 30, uh, here are official guests through foreign and You need to have clear ways of conveying the sentence during the debate. I think I'm pretty clear. I think it's just a it's just a document summarizing like a briefing that Israeli officials had. Yeah, okay. So he here is um, referring to Island, yeah. But it's not even it's not even like a factual analysis of the concentration camp thing. So like let's say that we agreed with Norm and we're like, okay, cool, let's go look up his quote to see like the good argument. It's not even an argument for it being a concentration camp. It's just like him saying, like, yeah, God's basically a concentration camp, let's do something about this. Like at very least for the head of uh uh, Israel's national security establishment, the island, that as that occupying that position and also being Jewish, and here Wait, it's not a irrelevant. Fact. Destiny, how would you identify something as a concentration camp, though? Like, what is the answer? What is a concentration camp? What definition do we use? I personally, uh, almost everything involving the Holocaust or almost everything involving like Nazi shit, I probably would just abandon those terms because it's way too much gravity. Unless we're approaching something similar to at the very least a genocide, um, I probably would just wouldn't use these terms because you're calling, you are summoning such unfathomable moral weight behind the term concentration camp that I, I wouldn't use it to just describe a, a place of territorial dispute with a blockade. I don't think I would ever, like I wouldn't have described like um, all of Cuba as a massive concentration camp uh, because of a, you know, US embargo or whatever. I wouldn't, um, yeah, I just, I probably wouldn't. Even though what the concentration camp is. Destiny, it's not even an actual quote. Are there quotation marks? Yes, that particular part was quoted, yes. 
Go down the top is a summary. It says here that he quotes Island of a huge concentration camp with 1.3 million Palestinians. So that is a direct quote, or at least whoever's writing this cable is writing it as a direct quote. And you can assume, because he's such a right-wing fanatical, if I can use the term, I don't particularly like it, but fanatical Zionist, you can assume he wouldn't use that word in a glib fashion to describe Palestinians. And yet, knowing the situation as he does, that locution immediately leapt to mind. It's a huge concentration gap. There's nothing to argue here. There's nothing to debate here. It's just perfectly obvious to the naked eye. Like, it's self-evident. He's asking you for justifications, and you're saying it's axiomatic. Like, he's asking you for an argument, and you're saying that, like, well, no, it's just, like, a priori true. Of course, it's a concentration camp, obviously. Like, this guy wrote the word concentration camp. The second person I chose was Baruch Kimmerling, who was a senior sociologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So he's going to cite this guy that he's also cited in the past. But when we look at Kimberling's quote in his book, he also doesn't really justify it. He says, various versions of this idea became very popular. It's talking about the construction of the West Bank Wall. Various versions of this idea became very popular among Israeli Jews, and the construction of the fence began at the initiative of the former Minister of Defense, uh, Benjamin Ben Eliezer, more or less along the pre-67 lines. In fact, the fence around the Gaza Strip was completed a long time ago, and the Strip has become the largest concentration camp ever to exist. That's it. That's it. There's no underlying factual analysis. He's just like offhandedly refers to it as that. There is no factual analysis there. That credential ought, as it would in any other debate, carry weight. And the third person I chose was a person, Amir Haas, who A, lived in Gaza, B, is notorious for being a stickler on facts and detail, and three, professedly loathes Hamas and could never be found extenuating or apologizing for it. That is true, but she explicitly says, she explicitly says that, um, she says, one, the Gaza Strip is a concentration camp, but it's not like Bergen-Belsen. It's not like a Nazi concentration camp. Not only is it not like a concentration camp, she says that she is opposed to parallels that lack information, knowledge, and understanding, and are drawn for purposes of provocation. The use of the term here as concentration camp is based on the need to break free of the linguistic bonds of the Nazi period. He's trying to literally, he's trying to bring forth the idea of the Nazi period, and he's using it for provocation, the exact opposite of what the author intended. And he omits this last sentence when he's quoting her from that uh, Heretz article. So those seem to me to be very worthy pieces of testimony and evidence. And I do find it perplexing, leaving aside the fantasies about European trips, uh, leaving aside that kind of sheer lunacy by Mr. Moynihan, I do find it perplexing that these three individuals who I named couldn't distinguish between a concentration camp and Ecuador. I find that very hard to compute. And I also said the kinds of argument that Coleman Hughes made were just very commonplace with African Americans in the pre-civil rights era. You're doing, I remember one guy came on who's African American, uh, and he was a Coleman Hughes of his day. Yeah. But, and I'm not saying this in the charity sense to Coleman Hughes. I don't know him from Adam. I don't find him particularly interesting or particularly bright. Uh, I have nothing. This is he's not. He's no Mr. Piero. He's no child prodigy. I'm, yeah. To the extent that Ben Shapiro is a child prodigy, except in his Jewish mother's eyes, and every Jewish mother thinks their son or daughter is a child prodigy. But leave that aside. Um, I, uh, I don't, uh, you know, you just cause me. Oh, so you, I, I forgive you. In the 1960s, I remember. He's about to do the slavery example, and it fails on a philosophy. I already know what he's going to do, and it's not a good argument. He's about to make the argument that, like, well, some people argued that the slaves had better life expectancies and blah, 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 and that's why uh, slavery was actually good. But that argument is disanalogous, right? Slavery wasn't bad because of, uh, you know, because slaves died or because slaves had poor health or, like, that was irrelevant to the question. Slavery is bad because in the name of slavery, the implication is a revocation of autonomy. And in the United States, slavery was especially bad because chattel slavery meant that by virtue of your skin color that you and your entire fucking progeny would forever be slaves with no way out. You will never have freedom. Even if the slaves of the United States were the healthiest, strongest, longest life expectancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the moral failing there is the revocation of autonomy part. It's the lack of autonomy. It's the, it's the destruction of your freedom it's the in admittance of you as a as an autonomous adult human being it has nothing to do with you if somebody were to say that slavery if somebody for instance if somebody was to say slavery was bad because the slaves were not healthy then you actually could rightly say well hold on that's not a good argument uh slaves in the united states were healthy compared to blah 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 but you would never argue against slavery on the grounds of the health or the life expectancy of a slave you'd argue against it on the grounds of philosophically why slavery is bad you know, it was the civil rights era. It was my youth. You remember these sorts of things. There was an African American who came on. He was a kind of what you might call a. Uh, uh, I just did a whole shadow pre-argument straw man. I just did a straw man argument, okay? Because Norman didn't say that, but we're about to see the very rare, maybe 
if my prediction powers are correct, we're about to see the Steel Man straw man, where I punched a straw man to kill it, but there was actually a Steel Man underneath the straw man, and he was constructing it the whole time. Let's see if he says it. Sorry. Or I'm totally wrong, and I just wasted all of that. So I... A pre Coleman Hughes, and he said, "If we were in Africa, we'd still be swinging on trees." That's what he said. It is. I think there was a guy who responded to him. I thought in a quite clever way. He said, "As far as I know, the only one who swung on trees in Africa was Tarzan, and he was white." <laughs> that's very true. Yeah, I thought it was a very insightful comment. Yeah, that's it's the same argument. The the idea that like, well, when they came to America, they were healthier. They weren't on trees. They had more economic opportunity. That's a right winger. That's a Nazi argument. Well, sorry. That was a far right argument of the, uh, yeah, well, when they come to America, look at how much better off they were. They might be better off. That could be true for a variety of different ways. But that doesn't make the underlying philosophical underpinning of slavery morally acceptable. (sighs) What a weird 34 and a half minute video to never actually bring up a point. Bro, I've got a five hour convo. He wasted 35 minutes here saying nothing. Holy shit.